In a dense forest within an enigmatic land, a sudden chase unfolded. A mysterious hooded figure adorned in a sky-blue cloak found herself being pursued by several dark figures. These shadowy pursuers relentlessly yelled at their potential victim to halt in her tracks. The escapee turned to face her pursuers, her bright blue eyes and long eyelashes captivating their attention. With agility, she evaded an incoming sword strike from one of her devilish-looking monstrous pursuers who rode beastly mounts in hot pursuit. In a swift motion, the mysterious figure drew an arrow, half turning her body to confront her pursuers. Knocking the arrow onto her bowstring, she released it with a focused gaze. The projectile flew swiftly, finding its mark in one of her pursuers. The malevolent pursuers were taken aback by her unexpected counterattack, their anger palpable. The leader, recognizing the value of their quarry's life, urged his companions to release their fallen comrade and focus on capturing the elusive figure. As they closed in on her, she glanced back just in time to see a monstrous claw descending upon her. In a daring move, she shed her cloak, allowing it to be torn away as she raced towards the cliff's edge. With a swift leap, she plunged into the abyss below. Mid-air, she took one final aim at her pursuers, releasing an arrow that found its mark in the throat of one who was caught off guard. The enigmatic young woman exuded a determined and valiant expression as she prepared to face her enemies. With unwavering resolve, she dove into the depths of the water below. Nearby, in the forest, a young man observed the entire confrontation from behind a tree, clutching a sachet of mustard in his mouth and sweating profusely. As he trembled with fear, the young man pondered the origins of the individuals engaged in the skirmish. Despite his inability to comprehend their language, he found himself captivated by the unfolding drama. Holding a bowl of freshly opened noodles, he questioned how such a seemingly mundane act could lead to such a chaotic situation. Despite his apprehension towards the pursuers clad in unfamiliar attire, the young man couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement at witnessing the intense pursuit. His name was Chen Daolin, and as he crouched behind the tree, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was part of a legendary transmigration. Earlier that day, Chen Daolin met with his friend Big B on a sweltering afternoon. Despite the heat, Chen Daolin donned a hoodie as he recounted the events that led him to their meeting. Reminding Big B of the WeChat post seeking someone to watch a warehouse, Chen Daolin explained that he was in search of a Wi-Fi signal for his phone. When asked about payment, Chen Daolin nonchalantly replied that as long as there was Wi-Fi and air conditioning, the compensation was of little concern. Big B couldn't resist teasing Chen Daolin about his lack of interaction with girls over the summer break. Chen Daolin responded with a cold stare and a quick comeback that caught Big B off guard. It was so unexpected that Big B almost choked on his own words. The scene turned comical as Chen Daolin frantically searched for a better Wi-Fi signal, finally finding full bars. Big B couldn't help but ask if his friend was there to help or just for the Wi-Fi and air conditioning. As Big B got closer, he overheard a voice message left for Chen Daolin by a pretty girl, inviting him to go shopping because she was bored. Chen Daolin found it inconvenient due to the timing, Big B gave up on Chen Daolin's help with watching the warehouse, but Chen Daolin surprised him by saying he would keep his promise as long as he had Wi-Fi and air conditioning. Once Big B left, Chen Daolin took a moment to enjoy the refreshing air conditioning, which was a relief from the summer heat. He set up his space, prepared a bowl of instant noodles, and started working on his laptop. As he opened the cup of noodles, the aroma filled the air, making his mouth water. Do you want to know the name of this manga, along with all the manga names of the recaps we did in our channel? How about also the chapter numbers our recaps end? You can simply ask the names in our Discord community for free or become a donor to get them all in one place. You can either be a donor in Patreon or be a member in our YouTube channel. Just scan this QR code or go to the link in the description to become a donor. Moreover, becoming a donor automatically makes you a VIP member of our Discord server with over tens of thousands of members. However, his attention was suddenly drawn to a strange buzzing sound coming from within the warehouse. Curiosity peaked, he grabbed his cup of noodles and went to investigate. To his surprise, he discovered a misplaced door with a glowing outline of an etched tulip on it. Chen Daolin couldn't help but be captivated by the peculiar sight before him. Was it a broken door that had been left abandoned in the warehouse? As he approached for a closer look, he couldn't shake the feeling that the door was beckoning him. Intrigued, he reached out to trace the intricate etching of a tulip, wondering if this door held a hidden history as an antique. To his astonishment, the mysterious door suddenly creaked open, creating a rush of air that pulled him inside. Panic surged through Chen Daolin as he found himself being transported through space, surrounded by a desolate starfield. In this unfamiliar world, he hid in fear, his eyes fixated on the lifeless bodies of his pursuers strewn across the beach. In this dangerous place, Chen Daolin couldn't help but question how he had ended up here and cursed his luck. Trembling with fear, he couldn't forget the haunting image of lives being extinguished before his eyes. Suddenly, a sound caught his attention, 
and he cautiously peered out from behind a tree. His eyes widened as he witnessed the graceful emergence of a mysterious girl from the depths of the water. Surprisingly, she was still alive, defying his expectations. Determined not to be found by this witch, he observed her figure and found himself immediately captivated. She wasn't a witch at all, but a remarkably beautiful girl. Furthermore, she exuded a unique combination of strength and beauty, both inside and out. It was evident to him immediately that she was a champion of justice, while her pursuers were clearly the villains in this scenario. With a nosebleed and a twinkle in his eye, he unconsciously gave her a thumbs up in approval, admiring her fearless execution of justice. The girl strolled towards the riverbank, fixing a steely gaze on her defeated opponents. Some of them were still alive and were astonished to see her standing. One of them snorted angrily, questioning her audacity to escape. Despite their weakened state, they were determined not to let her slip away. However, in a swift motion, the girl drew a dagger with a chilling expression, surprising Chen Daolin. He pondered her intentions as she swiftly struck at her incapacitated pursuers, leaving him speechless. In addition, her precision and merciless expression made it seem as if she were a crazed maniac playing whack-a-mole. Chen Daolin was taken aback when the girl lifted multiple severed heads tied to a rope. Fear gripped him, causing him to hide in the nearby bushes hastily. The girl noticed his sudden movement and swiftly charged at him, dagger in hand, ready to strike. Unfortunately, Chen Daolin had no time to evade the impending attack. However, in a desperate attempt, he leaned back, narrowly avoiding the dagger as it grazed his hair. At that moment, he recalled the mysterious door he had entered to reach this new world. Without hesitation, he turned frantically and sprinted towards the exit leading back to the real world. Despite his belief that he was running at full speed, he was astounded and nearly coughed up blood when he realized the mysterious girl effortlessly kept pace with him. Luckily, Chen Daolin reached the door just in the nick of time and forcefully pushed it open. He was determined not to meet his demise so quickly. As he stumbled into the warehouse, crashing onto the floor, he endured the pain and swiftly surveyed his surroundings. To his disbelief, he found himself back in the dimly lit warehouse. He swore to himself that he would never consume instant noodles again, unable to fathom how he had managed to survive. The next day, Big B returned to the warehouse and found himself in a heated argument with Chen Daolin. It seemed that Chen Daolin was unwilling to grant him access to the warehouse. Big B couldn't understand why his friend was behaving so strangely, and he even suspected that Chen Daolin might be secretly cross-dressing. Frustrated, Big B gave up on entering the warehouse and instead asked Chen Daolin to send him a photo on WeChat to prove his suspicions. This peculiar request greatly irritated Chen Daolin. Inside the warehouse, he prepared himself for his upcoming adventure into the new world. He had managed to purchase various pieces of equipment at a reasonable price, including hiking gear, fiberglass body armor, an electric taser, and even a crossbow for self-defense. Chen Daolin was determined not to be caught off guard again, so he made sure to gather all the necessary items. Without any hesitation, he bravely jumped through the dimensional door. As he arrived in the new world, Chen Daolin was greeted by a breathtaking sight. The vast landscape was filled with lush greenery, and he couldn't help but take a deep breath of the clean, unpolluted air. He cherished being in nature, away from the pollution of the city. While exploring the forest, he stumbled upon some golden fruits that he had never seen before. However, his joy was momentarily interrupted when a strange beast suddenly appeared from the bushes behind him. Despite the initial scare, Chen Daolin couldn't contain his excitement and happily frolicked through the forest like an awestruck child. Chen Daolin arrived at the shores of the lake he had visited on his first trip, feeling a profound sense of tranquility wash over him as he gazed at the serene waters. Despite the psychological turmoil he had endured during his initial visit, he knelt at the lake shore, splashing water on his face and taking a refreshing sip. The taste of the lake water was unparalleled, the purest mountain spring water he had ever encountered. Chen Daolin couldn't help but worry that he may never have the opportunity to drink from it again. Lost in contemplation, he suddenly sensed a presence nearby. Looking at his reflection in the water, he saw a dark figure approaching stealthily. A shiver ran down Chen Daolin's spine, prompting him to let out a startled cry and sprint away in fear. As he fled, he begged his pursuer to spare him, promising to keep their encounter a secret. He implored the figure to disappear as if they had never crossed paths. In his haste, Chen Daolin accidentally triggered a trap, causing his foot to become ensnared and hoisted into the air. Suspended upside down, he dropped his backpack in the chaos. In a state of panic, Chen Daolin frantically waved his hands in the air, accusing the girl of setting a trap in advance. He feared for his life and pleaded with her to stay away. The mysterious girl, holding a dagger with an irritated expression, swiftly cut the rope binding his foot. As Chen Daolin lay on the ground in a panic, he was struck on the head by an object, bringing him back to reality. Realizing he was still alive, Chen Daolin was deeply moved when the girl not only freed him, but also offered him a cookie. At that moment, he vowed that cookies would become his favorite food. He then noticed the sachet of mustard in the girl's hand, 
recognizing it as the same one he had dropped on his last visit to the New World. Relieved that the girl showed no immediate intention of harming him, Chen Daolin seized the opportunity to offer her an energy bar. Initially guarded, the mysterious girl eventually warmed up to him as he continued to provide her with interesting snacks. This newfound connection allowed Chen Daolin to relax and feel a sense of happiness. Despite the girl's inability to communicate and her intimidating appearance, Chen Daolin found solace in the fact that he had managed to establish a basic level of trust with her, all thanks to food. Just then, the girl curiously prodded at his fiberglass armor. Chen Daolin wasted no time in explaining that it served as a reminder of his journey to this new world. To further solidify his connection to this place, he had the symbol of a tulip painted on it as a talisman. He mentioned that the seller had done it as a special bonus for being a loyal customer. The mysterious girl seemed puzzled by his words and resumed eating without much thought. However, her expression suddenly changed as she glanced at Chen Daolin. From his perspective, her energy resembled that of an enthusiastic puppy. The young man couldn't help but wonder if something was amiss, but before he could ponder further, the girl unexpectedly lunged at him, knocking him to the ground. At that moment, fear gripped Chen Daolin as he thought she had finally decided to harm him. However, to his surprise, she wore a severe expression and covered his mouth with her hand, signaling for him to remain silent. Sensing some movement in the surroundings, she looked up. With the full moon illuminating the sky, a howl pierced through the forest, echoing in the distance. Suddenly, a pair of menacing eyes appeared in the darkness, belonging to a pack of wolves that swiftly encircled the duo. While the girl remained on guard, Chen Daolin couldn't help but feel bewildered by this sudden turn of events. The wolves were far from ordinary. They were demon wolves. Chen Daolin barely had time to process this before one of the wolves growled menacingly, catching the girl's attention. Without hesitation, the demon wolf lunged at her. In a split second, the girl sprang into action, leaping into the air to intercept the attack. Chen Daolin watched in awe as the girl bravely faced the wolf head on. She skillfully dodged its initial strike and attempted to grab its throat with her left arm. However, the wolf surprised her by charging an energy attack in its mouth, catching her off guard. The demon wolf unleashed the energy blast, creating an explosion in the air around itself and the girl. Meanwhile, the rest of the pack closed in for an attack. The girl fended them off as best as she could, but one wolf turned its attention to Chen Daolin. Panicking, he remembered the weapons he had brought with him. In a desperate move, Chen Daolin sprinted towards his weapon stash, with the wolf hot on his heels. He refused to go down without a fight, especially after all he had been through to reach this new world. Just in time, he grabbed his taser and zapped the wolf as it lunged at him. After the intense battle, the wolf lay motionless on the ground, its mouth foaming. Chen Daolin struggled to catch his breath, relieved that the teaser had lived up to his expectations. He made a mental note to leave a glowing 10,000-star review for the product once he returned. Suddenly, a flash of light caught his eye, piquing his curiosity. To his amazement, Chen Daolin witnessed a mysterious girl standing at the edge of a cliff, holding the severed head of the alpha wolf. The clearing in the forest below was now under her watchful gaze. The surviving demon wolves, realizing their leader had been defeated, grew even more cautious. Little did they know, the warrior princess was far from finished. With a fierce glare, she swiftly attacked the remaining wolves while they were still airborne. As the mysterious girl landed gracefully, she raised her head, reveling in the blood of her enemies. Chen Daolin's surprise turned to concern when he saw her figure sway and collapse. Acting swiftly, he caught her before she hit the ground. Worriedly, he asked if she was all right, only to notice blood trickling from the corner of her mouth. Additionally, her shoulder bore a deep gash that bled profusely. Chen Daolin's heart raced as he took in the depth of the girl's wound. The urgency of the situation hit him like a ton of bricks. If he didn't act quickly, she would surely perish. At that moment, he made a swift decision and remembered that he had a first aid kit tucked away in his bag. A sudden realization washed over him, causing him to turn back and gaze at the motionless figure of the girl. As he stood there, he couldn't help but acknowledge that he had no clue about the girl's true intentions. He also knew that this could be his best chance to escape. Ever since stumbling upon the mysterious door, his mind had been consumed by adrenaline and a thirst for adventure. He had eagerly prepared himself to embark on a journey into the unknown, fueled by the tales of adventure he had devoured in books. But all of that changed when he witnessed the brutal fight between the girl and the pack of wolves. The sight of her gruesome wound, coupled with the scent of blood in the air, shattered his fantasies in an instant. Chen Daolin realized that he was just an ordinary person, and if he chose to run away now, he wouldn't face any more danger. For a brief moment, he seriously contemplated retreating to his familiar world. However, his heart softened when he caught a glimpse of the pained expression on the girl's face. He knew that she had endured this injury because of him, and despite her skills, she had chosen to fight the wolves to protect him. At that very moment, 
he made a firm decision, choosing not to flee. He knew deep within his soul that if he ran away, he would forever despise himself. As he retrieved the first aid kit, he fueled his determination with the belief that a man of honor would never abandon an injured girl. With this conviction, he swiftly began tending to her wounds, skillfully applying the bandages. While disinfecting her injuries, he found solace in the thought that he had come to this new world to conquer it, determined to become an unparalleled hero. As the sun rose and cast its radiant light upon the lush forest, the mysterious girl regained consciousness and sat up, feeling the comfort of her dressed wounds. She scolded herself internally for fainting the previous night. Suddenly, a memory resurfaced, reminding her of the suspicious man who had been by her side. She turned her gaze and was astonished to find him still there, peacefully dozing against a rock. Chen Daolin was lost in a vivid dream, clutching his backpack tightly. However, the mysterious girl approached him and playfully flicked his nose, rousing him from his slumber. Chen Daolin couldn't believe his eyes as he watched the girl's towering figure. Her strange expression made him even more curious. Just as he was about to ask if she was feeling better, she turned away and let out an annoyed huff. Concerned, Chen Daolin warned her not to move too much in case her wound reopened. Little did he know, he was about to witness something truly extraordinary. The girl suddenly dropped to the ground and placed her hand against it. In an instant, mystical patterns materialized, surrounded by a vibrant green aura. Chen Daolin was taken aback by the divine light and couldn't help but wonder what kind of ritual the girl was performing. After the spectacle, Chen Daolin decided to set up a fire and put a pot over it, preparing breakfast for the both of them. As the mysterious girl walked away, Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder what she was up to. To his surprise, she grabbed his kitchen knife and skillfully butchered the severed head of the alpha wolf. Chen Daolin tried his best to focus on cooking, but he couldn't help but steal glances at her. Suddenly, she handed him something, leaving him astonished. In his hands, Chen Daolin held a pink crystal, which he realized had been extracted from the wolf's head. He couldn't help but wonder if it was the legendary crystal core of a demonic beast. Examining it under the sunlight, he expressed his gratitude for the beautiful gift. In response, the mysterious girl blushed. In a mysterious encounter, the enigmatic girl gestured towards herself in an attempt to introduce herself. After several failed attempts to communicate, Chen Daolin settled on calling her Xiaolan. In return, the girl referred to him as Darling, after struggling to pronounce his name. As dusk approached once again, Chen Daolin felt a sense of unease and urgently called out to Xiaolan, who was sharpening knives. Frantically gesturing, he tried to convey his need to use the restroom, assuring her it was not an emergency. Despite his efforts to reassure her he was not fleeing, he dashed into the forest, promising to return promptly. Later that evening, Chen Daolin bathed in the lake, reveling in the refreshing sensation that washed away the grime of the day. As he basked in the moment of tranquility, he was suddenly struck by a violent nosebleed. To his astonishment, Xiao Lan appeared by the lake, her ethereal figure illuminated by the moon and distant stars. Chen Daolin couldn't believe his eyes when Xiao Lan suddenly appeared before him. He was utterly taken aback and found himself lost in a whirlwind of thoughts, trying to make sense of the situation. Meanwhile, Xiao Lan stood beside him, her expression indifferent as she discreetly covered herself up. She observed the young man in front of her, amused by his bewildered state. As Chen Daolin struggled to understand what was happening, he couldn't help but feel frustrated by his own body's lack of response. Xiaolan approached him with an expectant look, and in his flustered state, Chen Daolin offered her a bar of soap, asking if she would like to use it. Deep down, he scolded himself for his awkwardness, but he was determined to break the ice. Feeling shy, Chen Daolin turned away from Xiaolan, who curiously sniffed the soap and found it to be pleasantly fragrant. In his flustered state, he quickly explained that after a long day and night of being tossed about, she should take a good bath. He also added that she shouldn't casually approach him while doing so. In the next moment, something unexpected happened. As Chen Daolin made his way toward the shore, he suddenly felt a tender sensation on his back. He turned around to find Xiaolan's slender hand gently resting on him. Caught off guard, he couldn't help but wonder if something was wrong. However, in response, Xiaolan softly breathed on his neck, causing Chen Daolin's blood to surge with a sudden intensity. He turned towards her, and in an instant they shared a tender moment. The following day, as the sun's rays pierced through the thick forest canopy, they fell upon Chen Daolin, who appeared drained from the events of the previous night. His face had a slight hollowness to it, and before long he was startled by a sudden movement. To his surprise, he saw the delicate figure holding a knife and he quickly began explaining that he hadn't meant any harm the night before. However, it seemed that he had misunderstood the situation. Xiao Lan was simply gesturing with the knife, trying to convey something. Chen Daolin assumed she was sharpening it. His curiosity piqued, Chen Daolin immediately asked if she was sharpening his knife, to which the girl nodded in response. 
Her expression remained neutral, leaving Chen Dalin puzzled as to why it seemed as though nothing had transpired between them the previous night. It made him wonder if he was missing something. Deciding to set aside his thoughts, Chen Daolin soon regained his usual lively demeanor and began bombarding her with questions, from how she slept to where she wanted to go that day. He was inwardly frustrated, trying to make sense of the situation. It seemed as though the girl was purposefully ignoring him despite their shared experiences from the night before. Moreover, what made him pout the most was the fact that she seemed to be ignoring the previous night's event and wasn't saying anything about it. The two had been through a lot together, and as such, he wondered why she was suddenly cold. It was at that moment that Chen Dalin felt that, that he had been used, and his eyes teared up. However, he was not willing to accept how things had played out. He gritted his teeth and clenched his fist with determination, desiring to do something about it. The next moment, he kowtowed to her and expressed his sincerity by offering a drink to relieve her fatigue. However, Xiaolan did not even look at him. Even so, she took the drink from his hands and took a sip. The intense flavor caused her to cough slightly, which caused Chen Daolin to wonder whether she had never drunk alcohol at all. In response, Xiaolan said that she was not allowed to drink. Her unexpected reaction caused an awkward silence, after which Chen Daolin spat in shock. However, he quickly regained his composure and anxiously questioned why he could suddenly comprehend her words. Xiaolan promptly clarified that she had cast a simple language spell before inquiring why Chen Daolin seemed so taken aback. After all, she had witnessed him conjuring lightning from a staff, so she assumed he was a mage. Chen Daolin awkwardly pondered why the girl hadn't used the spell from the start, as it would have saved them a lot of time. Xiaolin casually explained that she theoretically could have used it earlier. However, being a martial artist, she typically couldn't perform magic unless under exceptional circumstances. When Chen Daolin inquired about these circumstances, Xiaolan casually alluded to their activities from the previous night, causing the young man to once again spit out in shock. Due to their intimate encounter, he had started daydreaming about the next exciting chapter in their relationship, only to realize that it had all been one-sided and merely a means to cast a spell. In response, Xiaolan let out an awkward sigh, remarking on Chen Daolin's sudden change in mood. The duo sat in uncomfortable silence for a while before Chen Daolin finally broke it by admitting that he had no idea where they were. Blushing slightly, Xiaolan revealed that they were currently in the frozen forest at the Great Round Lake, located in the north of the empire. Upon the young man's inquiry, Xiaolan explained the name Frozen Lake. She revealed that it originated over a century ago during an invasion that drastically altered the climate. When Chen Daolin inquired about the empire's precise location, Xiaolan proceeded to describe a series of landmarks that needed to be navigated. Among these landmarks, the Kaspersky defense line captured the young man's attention. He hesitantly questioned the accuracy of its name, leaving Xiaolan perplexed. In her confusion, she wondered how he, as a wearer of the Tulip family crest on his armor, was unfamiliar with the defense line established by the first duke of the family. Chen Daolin took a moment to reflect and speculated that the glowing tulip etched on the trans-dimensional door and the mysterious defense line were all connected to this Tulip Duke. He pondered whether it was all merely a coincidence and realized that the Tulip Duke was no ordinary individual. In that instant, he decided to pretend to understand and inquire further, which naturally caught the astute Xiaolan's attention. She patiently explained that a century ago, the first-generation Tulip Duke constructed an impregnable defense line that aided the Empire in resisting the invasion and launching a counterattack. Furthermore, Xiaolan added that the first-generation Tulip Duke's accomplishments were widely revered, making him the most esteemed individual on the entire continent. However, her explanation was abruptly cut short as she sensed a peculiar presence in the vicinity, indicating that someone was approaching. Chen Daolin, engrossed in his note-taking, was suddenly pulled away, leaving him bewildered and wondering if a boss had arrived. As Xiaolan dragged him along, she gracefully leaped into the air while the young man's arms flailed helplessly. He complained that he should have been given a warning beforehand. The swift movement caused him to foam at the mouth and lose consciousness. Eventually, they reached a hiding spot, where Xiaolan instructed the young man to hold onto the tree trunk tightly and not let go. Meanwhile, the young man noticed some commotion unfolding below. With a serious expression, Xiaolan emphasized the importance of not being discovered under any circumstances, as it would lead to their demise. Before the young man could inquire further, a sudden movement caught the girl's immediate attention. From their advantageous position, they witnessed a horde of beastmen and their mounts rampaging below. Xiaolan remarked on the audacity of these beastmen, who dared to invade the elves' territory solely for their beasts to graze. The ferocious horde wreaked havoc beneath the forest canopy, prompting Xiaolan to express her discontent towards these barbaric beings who only knew destruction, their actions serving no purpose other than to provoke the elf clan. Chen Daolin, a curious visitor in this realm, 
couldn't help but inquire about the intriguing beastmen and the enigmatic elf tribe. In response, Xiao Lan unraveled the tale, revealing that the beastmen initially resided solely in the northern plains of the continent, where they established their kingdoms. However, as time passed and their hunger grew, they sought to expand their territories, ultimately leading them to the vast frozen forest, a perfect grazing ground for their livestock. Even though this meant encroaching upon the elf territory, the beastmen audaciously engaged in large-scale animal grazing multiple times a year. When Chen Daolin questioned whether the elves took action against this intrusion, Xiaolan explained that the great elves held the highest authority. Even the leaders of the beastmen had to pay homage to the elf king. Nevertheless, the grass elves were considered to have a lower status among the elves, and thus the beastmen showed no respect towards them. It became evident that the beastmen were nothing more than bullies, preying on the weak and cowering before the strong. With a solemn expression, Xiaolan emphasized that the more relentless the beastmen's attacks became, the more extravagant and flamboyant the elves' resistance grew. As she spoke, a dazzling radiance emanated from the depths of the forest, and a colossal pillar of golden light soared into the heavens, unleashing powerful shockwaves that reverberated throughout the entire area. Below the glowing pillar, a collection of bows were poised and ready to strike. Without warning, the arrows were set loose, cascading down like a storm upon the beastmen who were scrambling in panic. The magical arrows showed no mercy as they decimated the enemy forces. In a desperate move, the leader of the Beastmen Horde commanded a retreat, seeking refuge with the Grass Elves. Xiaolan, observing the chaos, remarked on the power of the Grass Elf tribe, while Chen Daolin trembled in fear. Once the dust settled, Xiaolan urged Chen Daolin to come down from the tree trunk. When Xiaolan mentioned they had an important task ahead, Chen Daolin assumed it was related to the battlefield or spying. To his surprise, Xiaolan revealed they needed to eat prompting an awkward agreement from Chen Daolin. Discovering the remains of a phantom deer, Xiaolan swiftly began preparing it for their meal, acknowledging the usefulness of Chen Daolin's kitchen knife. As Chen Daolin turned away, unable to witness the butchering, Xiaolan nonchalantly roasted the meat over the flames, assuring him it would soon be ready. Xiaolan's actions took advantage of Chen Daolin, as he quickly intervened to take over the dinner preparations. Despite his insistence, Xiaolan remained doubtful of his wilderness survival skills and decided to take charge of cooking the dish herself. Undeterred, Chen Daolin persisted in trying to convince her to let him handle the task. To his surprise, Xiaolan revealed that she was actually a professional ascetic and that cooking such dishes was within her expertise. She reassured Chen Daolin not to feel guilty, but he couldn't help but express his concern for the deer thigh she held. This left Xiaolan momentarily puzzled. Chen Daolin then went on to explain how fresh and succulent the deer thigh was, only to watch in dismay as Xiaolan tossed it into the fire, causing him to lament the waste of such a delicacy. As he pointed out the burnt corner, Xiaolan inquired about the proper way to roast the deer meat. In response, Chen Daolin struck a heroic pose, proclaiming himself the barbecue king, and proceeded to outline the meticulous steps involved in roasting the meat. From setting up a comfortable rack to applying sauce, and even giving the deer thigh a relaxing massage to tenderize the muscle fibers, he spared no detail. And to top it off, he unveiled his secret weapon, the Super Invincible Picnic Barbecue Seasoning Set. The young man captivated Xiaolan with an enchanting performance, showcasing his extraordinary collection of spices. He urged her not to question why he had brought them to another realm, and instead requested to be called Doraemon. Xiaolan was left in awe by the tantalizing aroma of the spices and couldn't help but inquire about their nature. In response, Chen Daolin mysteriously claimed that they were a divine creation. In no time, he skillfully roasted the deer thigh to perfection, generously glazing it with a layer of honey. When he turned to ask if Xiaolan had ever tasted such a delicacy, he was taken aback to find her already salivating and eagerly anticipating the feast. It was as if she had transformed into a ravenous zombie. Without hesitation, he sliced a piece of the succulent meat and offered it to her. As Xiaolan took a bite, she was immediately entranced. It felt as though an electric current surged through her body, sending a jolt of pleasure to her senses. After a while, the duo sat back, their stomachs bulging with contentment. Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder why he had indulged to the point of immobility. Later on, Chen Daolin extended a drink to Xiaolan, but she politely declined, explaining that she couldn't consume alcohol. She expressed her deep admiration for the delectable meal and confessed that she had never fathomed such extraordinary food could exist in the world. When Chen Daolin inquired about Xiaolan's past hardships, she politely requested him to refrain from using that name, prompting him to ask which name he should use instead. Xiaolan, now known as Lan Lan, appeared a bit shy as she revealed her actual name. Chen Daolin found this revelation endearing, which Lan Lan noticed as he gazed at her intently. Curious about his interest, she questioned his motives, 
to which she simply replied that she was beautiful. Lan Lan humbly dismissed the compliment, mentioning the presence of other stunning individuals among the ascetics who served the gods. Intrigued by Lan Lan's background, Chen Daolin inquired about her journey to becoming an ascetic. Lan Lan recounted her upbringing in a church orphanage, where she acquired essential skills and eventually transitioned into a life of asceticism. She admitted to simply going with the flow without much contemplation. When Chen Daolin attempted to delve deeper into the concept of life choices, Lan Lan adamantly requested him to refrain from further discussion, emphasizing that everything she possessed was bestowed upon her by the church. Lan Lan's dedication to the gods was unwavering, as she had made an oath long ago to live her life as a priest. With a distant look in her eyes, she expressed her disappointment in not being able to be more than that. Chen Daolin's mind drifted back to the night they had shared, a look of concern crossing his face as he glanced at Lan Lan. However, she reassured him that it was her choice. Her unexpected response left Chen Daolin speechless, and Lan Lan asked if he wanted to know the reason behind her actions. The young man's face turned red and he nervously scratched the back of his head. Lan Lan went on to explain that, according to the teachings she followed, she should have killed Chen Daolin for seeing her body. But she couldn't bring herself to harm the one who had saved her life. Her words surprised Chen Daolin. As Lan Lan prodded at the remaining deer meat, she mentioned something her teacher had said about her lack of strong faith in their religion. Chen Daolin felt a wave of relief wash over him, knowing that his life was not in danger. He couldn't help but wonder if Lan Lan's emotional outburst meant that she was somehow drawn to him. It was a side of her he had never seen before. Lan Lan couldn't contain her joy as she savored the delicious meal, momentarily forgetting all her troubles. However, Chen Daolin couldn't help but notice a hint of sadness in her eyes. Despite his curiosity, he decided not to pry into her matters, understanding that her happiness was more important than his need for answers. Just as he was lost in his thoughts, he noticed Lan Lan's frustration as she struggled to finish the deer thigh. Worried for her well-being, Chen Daolin quickly intervened, cautioning her about the dangers of overeating. He gently suggested that she discard the remaining food if she couldn't finish it. In a heartfelt gesture, he promised to cook for her every day as long as she desired it. As he made this promise, his eyes sparkled with excitement, only to realize that the girl before him had a similar sparkle in her eyes, rendering her speechless. Thinking that they were about to share another intimate moment, their tranquility was abruptly interrupted by a voice from behind. Turning around, they were greeted by the presence of an elegant elf who apologized for intruding. Chen Daolin was momentarily stunned by the elf's extraordinary beauty, feeling as though this otherworldly being didn't belong in their realm. At that moment, he realized that Lan Lan's sparkling eyes were not directed at him, but rather fixated on the enchanting elf standing before them. The distinguished elven gentleman politely excused himself, explaining that he had detected a unique aroma and had come to investigate. He quickly apologized in case his actions had offended anyone. Chen Daolin regarded him with annoyance, while Xiao Lan looked at him with admiration in her eyes. Introducing himself as Luo Xue, the gentleman was approached by Lan, who urged him not to be overly polite or blame himself. Meanwhile, Lin questioned when Lan had arrived and expressed irritation at the feminine sound of the name Luo Xue, despite the elf's masculine appearance. Taking a moment to scrutinize the stranger's features, Chen Daolin observed masculine traits such as Adam's apple and a muscular chest, as well as the distinctive long pointed ears. Xiao Lan kindly offered the stranger a piece of venison, prompting Chen Daolin to wonder at her generosity towards someone they had just met. The stranger graciously accepted the food, mentioning that he had not eaten yet and smiling brightly in gratitude. Chen Daolin grew increasingly irritated by Xiao Lan's apparent fascination with the stranger, especially since he had been the one to prepare the meat. He was taken aback by Xiao Lan's decision to share without consulting him, feeling like an afterthought even in this unfamiliar world. As the awkward silence lingered, Chen Daolin's frustration reached a boiling point, prompting him to demand whether the stranger intended to eat the meat or not. Luo Xue, snapping back to reality, apologized for his lack of focus. Chen Daolin observed that the meat had gone cold, emphasizing that it was meant to be eaten and not merely admired. Luo Xue graciously accepted the criticism, while Lan Lan quickly interjected, praising the surprisingly delicious flavor of the meat. This remark struck a nerve with Chen Daolin. Later, a stranger joined the pair by the campfire and revealed that he was a vegan, causing Chen Daolin to become visibly agitated. He questioned why the stranger was at their campsite if he did not consume meat, even going as far as to spit in frustration. In response, Luo Xue shared a memory of a friend who was skilled at roasting meat, reminiscing about the camaraderie they shared. Despite the passage of time, the memory remained vivid in his heart, regretting that he never had the opportunity to taste his friend's cooking. 
Chen Daolin's anger persisted, as he believed the stranger should have at least pretended to be interested in the meat. As he glared at Luo Shui, the latter explained that the spices used in his friend's cooking were similar to those Chen Daolin favored, further fueling the tension between them. The young man's comment elicited an angry smirk from him as he cynically pondered about the other earthly delicacies the aliens might have attempted. With that thought in mind, he confidently produced a tin of black bean sauce, proudly asserting that the stranger had never laid eyes upon such a divine artifact, an artifact that defied the gods themselves. His actions left Luoxu momentarily stunned and speechless. Without hesitation, Chen Dalin seized the opportunity and boldly smeared some of the black bean sauce onto the venison, declaring it as his ultimate trump card. At that moment, Luoxue couldn't help but notice the striking resemblance between the young man before him and his old friend. Their words and mannerisms mirrored each other perfectly. A flood of memories rushed back to Luoxu, reminding him of the moments he shared with his dear friend, Du Wei. From their initial meeting to the conflicts they faced together, the elf vividly recalled the ancient battle between humans and beastmen. It was a time of great tragedy and loss. However, his reverie was abruptly interrupted when Lan Lan called out to him. Snapping back to reality, Luok Shui refocused his attention and found Lan Lan standing before him, concerned about his well-being. Apologizing for his momentary lapse, Luok Shui explained that he had been reminiscing about an old friend from the Roland Empire. Chen Daolin chimed in, expressing his surprise at the man's absent-mindedness. Luok Shui simply nodded, grateful for the reminder of his past and the bond he shared with his old friend. To his surprise, memories came rushing back, overwhelming him. Lan Lan, on the other hand, seemed captivated by the elf, while Chen Daolin appeared unimpressed. Luok Shui explained that it had been years since he last visited the Roland Empire. However, fate brought him face to face with a member of the Tulip family and the Light Church. Chen Daolin wasted no time in correcting the elf's assumption about his affiliation with the Tulip family. He made it clear that he had no connection to them, leaving the elf visibly confused as he pointed to the tulip emblem on Chen Daolin's breastplate. Chen Daolin quickly clarified that he had simply painted the tulip on his armor because he thought it looked aesthetically pleasing. The elf fell silent for a moment, realizing his mistake, and apologized for the misunderstanding. Moments later, he handed Chen Daolin a pouch filled with a non-alcoholic beverage as compensation for the venison, hoping that the young man would accept it. Intrigued by the fragrant aroma, Chen Daolin couldn't resist taking a sip. To his surprise, his body immediately relaxed with just one sip. Not only that, but he also discovered that the drink was incredibly delicious. Excitedly, he offered the same drink to Lan Lan, eager for her to experience it too. As she took a sniff, Lan Lan was both puzzled and enchanted as she instantly recognized what the drink was. In the Wisdom Forest, guarded by the Great Elves, there was a legendary plant called the Garuda Flower. It was said to be the source of the forest's magic, with its juice considered a valuable treasure. Only the elders of the elves could extract the most potent magic from the flowers, making it a coveted tool for mages seeking to advance their skills. Chen Daolin, however, was unimpressed by the tale. He dismissed it as nonsense, feeling irritated and skeptical. Despite Lan Lan's attempt to calm him down, Chen Daolin couldn't let go of his frustration. Meanwhile, overlooking the frozen forest Great Lake, Luok Shui stood silently with a faint smile. Suddenly, he sneezed repeatedly, wondering if he had caught a cold after many years without sneezing. At Chen Daolin's campsite, he angrily threw off his armor and expressed frustration that all he ever heard anyone talk about was the Tulip family. As the young man stomped on the piece of equipment, Lan Lan awkwardly warned him that speaking ill of the Tulip family within the Roland Empire could have dire consequences. In response, Chen Daolin turned towards her and questioned whether she understood the potential danger of her previous inquiry to the elf. While Luo Shui was still present, Lan Lan innocently asked whether the elf's promise with the descendants of the Tulip family was with the current Tulip Duke. Sensing the sensitivity of the question, Chen Daolin swiftly took Lan Lan's hand and led her away, stating it was time to rest for the long journey ahead the next day. As Chen Daolin bid their visitor farewell, the elf found him intriguing. In the present moment, Chen Daolin cautiously shared his theory about the elf, suspecting that the elf harbored a hidden secret. This suspicion arose from Luok Shui waiting for someone in the wilderness in the dead of night. With sweat beating on his forehead, Chen Daolin warned that they could find themselves in a precarious situation if they became entangled in the elf's affairs. Upon realizing the imminent threat of the approaching elf, Chen Daolin swiftly dismantled the camping site, urging Lan Lan to depart with him without delay. As he glanced up, he noticed Lan Lan gazing at him with a vacant expression, prompting him to inquire about her apparent distraction. Lan Lan in turn averted her gaze, apologized for her lack of awareness, and disclosed her sheltered upbringing within the confines of the church, which hindered her ability to assess situations accurately. 
Expressing regret for the potential harm she had inadvertently caused Chen Daolin, Lan Lan conveyed her feelings of guilt. Startled by her confession, Chen Daolin hastened to clarify his intentions, fearing a rift in their relationship. Much to his surprise, Lan Lan responded with a radiant smile, commending Chen Daolin for his foresight and quick thinking. In the midst of Lan Lan's charming smile, Chen Daolin found himself grappling with conflicting emotions. Despite his initial plan to return to his world, he suddenly felt a reluctance to part ways. A sense of inexplicable emptiness washed over him before he refocused his thoughts and, in a moment of inspiration, offered Lan Lan a bar of soap, deeming it more suitable for her use. Initially skeptical of the unexpected gesture, Lan Lan questioned Chen Daolin's motives, only to be reassured by his surplus supply of soap. She then requested him to keep it for the time being. To Chen Daolin's astonishment, Lan Lan gently grasped his hand, explaining that she would only accept the soap when the need arose. Chen Daolin was captivated by her delicate words, completely enchanted by her charm. At that moment, he couldn't help but wonder if she desired his constant presence by her side. Before he could fully process this thought, Lan Lan reached out and gently touched him while inquiring about his intentions to return home. This sudden display of affection caught Chen Daolin off guard, leaving him flustered. However, his surprise escalated when Lan Lan unexpectedly embraced him, causing a whirlwind of emotions to explode in his mind. In a daze, Chen Daolin found himself pondering what he should do in this situation, realizing that his mind had gone blank. Acting on instinct, he instinctively reached out to hold her close. But just as the tender moment was about to unfold, a stranger's hand patted him on the shoulder, abruptly interrupting the intimate atmosphere. Oblivious to the situation, the stranger inquired if they were at the Great Round Lake, utterly unaware of the fuse they had ignited within Chen Daolin. It seemed that people in this world were unable to read the room. Meanwhile, in a frozen forest elsewhere, a blade dripped with blood, and the echoes of a fierce roar reverberated through the air. A group of beastmen stood in confrontation, creating a tense atmosphere. Back at the camp, Chen Daolin turned around with annoyance, questioning the identity of the blind person who had interrupted him. To his surprise, he was met with the sight of a strikingly handsome young man who exuded an almost effeminate aura. Chen Daolin was taken aback by the new guy's appearance, but the latter quickly apologized for any unintentional offense. With a slight grin, the stranger inquired if they were fellow adventurers in the frozen forest. He then suggested joining them at their camp for mutual protection. However, Chen Daolin was not interested in hearing more from the stranger. He felt that the atmosphere had been ruined and wanted to send the unwelcome guest away. Dismissively, he urged the stranger to leave due to the dangerous monsters lurking in the forest. In response, the stranger reassured him of their ability to handle any demonic beasts. Suddenly, a storage ring adorned with draconic symbols began to glow brightly. The stranger revealed that his main concern was securing camping supplies. As the ring activated, various items emerged, including a wok, an apple, a loaf of bread, and a block of cheese. This time it was Chen Daolin who was mesmerized. Before him was the fabled magical storage ring, which he found incredibly fascinating and desired for himself. His thoughts were interrupted as the stranger magically reignited the campfire, urging Chen Daolin not to stare. The young man then disclosed that he was a mage, causing Chen Daolin to feel disheartened at encountering yet another mage. He sensed an invisible coercion that he found particularly loathsome. Clearing his throat, he prepared to inquire further about the stranger's storage ring. Chen Daolin clasped his hands together, addressing the stranger as Mr. Mage with a hint of regret for his impulsive behavior earlier. He humbly asked for forgiveness, to which the stranger responded with a hearty laugh, reassuring the young man not to blame himself. Meanwhile, Lan Lan discreetly shifted away from the duo, sensing the awkward tension in the air. Suddenly, Chen Daolin's gaze fell upon the mage's cape, which was adorned with the emblem of the Tulip family. This discovery led him to ponder whether this mage was the one the elf had been seeking, Noticing the nobleman-like attire of the mage, Chen Daolin boldly inquired if he was indeed a member of the Tulip family. Before the mage could answer, a distant roar echoed from the frozen forest, diverting their attention to a nocturnal beast. At that moment, the mage casually raised his hand and activated the storage ring from which he sprinkled a luminous powder around the campsite. He explained that the magical powder would ward off any demonic beast that dared to approach them that night. Chen Daolin, wide-eyed with wonder, asked if the mage had just used magic powder. The mage waved off the notion, claiming it was merely a harmless camping tool. Unconvinced by it, Chen Daolin decided to take a sample of the mysterious powder. He curiously brought it close to his nose, causing the stranger to be taken aback. As he inhaled the scent, Chen Daolin couldn't quite place it and struggled to find the right words to describe it. Without hesitation, he then put a finger coated with the powder into his mouth, discovering a fishy and salty flavor. The mage was left utterly shocked and speechless at this unexpected action, 
Chen Daolin turned to the stranger and eagerly asked about the composition of the powder. However, the stranger had no response, leaving Chen Daolin puzzled. In an attempt to answer his question, the stranger handed Chen Daolin a toothbrush, a tube of toothpaste, and something to gargle with, insisting that he rinse his mouth before going to sleep. Chen Daolin was immediately stunned when he realized that the items he was given were from his original world. Holding them in his hand, he closed his eyes and contemplated the peculiar names he had encountered, like the Kaspersky Defense Line. The fact that someone from this world had now provided him with a toothbrush and toothpaste led him to a rational conclusion. With eyes filled with wonder and a tearful face, Chen Daolin clenched his fist and concluded that the Tulip Duke must have been a fellow transmigrator. Lan Lan noticed his foolish expression and asked if he still wasn't going to rinse his mouth. At that moment, memories of their intimate moment flooded his mind, and he intended to continue from where they had left off. However, Lan Lan pushed him away, screaming that he shouldn't come near her until he had thoroughly rinsed his mouth. Chen Daolin, feeling slightly stunned and his face bruised somewhat, asked Lan Lan about the nature of the powder. With a grim expression, Lan Lan explained that the mage had been kind enough not to disclose its composition, but she posed a question about the best way to scare away wild beasts. Chen Daolin had no idea about this, and in frustration, he asked how he could know such a thing. Lan Lan, in a casual manner, explained that the answer lay in the scent of powerful beasts. This response sent a shiver down Chen Daolin's spine. Lan 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 nonchalantly elaborated on how beasts relied on strong smells to mark their territory. Suddenly, an image of a beast defecating popped into Chen Daolin's mind, causing him to panic and inquire if the powder was some tiger excrement. Naturally, Lan Lan refuted this, denying it, which momentarily relieved Chen Daolin that it wasn't feces. However, his relief was short-lived, as Lan Lan revealed that the powder was actually made from dragon droppings. Without wasting a moment, Chen Daolin plunged into the vast lake while Lan Lan struggled to hold back her laughter. Inwardly, Chen Daolin complained about being the most uncool transmigrator for consuming dragon poop. Tears streamed down his face as he clenched his teeth. His shout echoed through the forest, expressing his unwillingness to accept the situation. Little did he know that his loud cry had attracted the attention of some beastmen with menacing, glowing eyes. It seemed they had found their prey. As they ventured through the dark forest, Chen Daolin confided in Lan Lan about his worries regarding leaving the Tulip family guy behind. He feared that the latter would be hurt by their sudden departure without a proper farewell. In response, Lan Lan turned around and urged him not to be self-centered, reminding him that nobles like them would never care about ordinary people. It dawned on Chen Daolin that despite their lengthy conversation, he hadn't even shared his name with the mage. Lan Lan's words struck a chord, revealing the insincerity of the mage. Letting out a sigh, Lan Lan remarked that arrogance was a common trait among the nobility. This made Chen Daolin realize that Lan Lan despised the wealthy even more than he did. At that moment, he couldn't help but boast, claiming that he wouldn't have been as pompous if he were in the mage's shoes. Furthermore, Chen Daolin criticized the mage for looking down on others when he spoke as if he were superior. Lan Lan found his comment amusing, appreciating his straightforwardness. However, Chen Daolin continued his bravado, declaring that he would rather die than tell a lie. Suddenly, Lan Lan's face drained of color as she noticed something alarming, warning Chen Daolin to be cautious. Before they knew it, a slashing sound filled the air, and blood stained the ground. Lan Lan's face contorted in horror, tears streaming down her cheeks. She frantically called out for Chen Daolin, sprinting towards him with a piercing scream. However, Chen Daolin only caught fleeting glimpses of her tear-streaked face, completely unaware that something was amiss. It was only when he looked down that he noticed the chilling sight of a spear piercing through his chest. As his vision dimmed, the last thing Chen Daolin saw was Lan Lan's tearful expression. At that moment, he realized that he could no longer hear her voice. Suddenly, an overwhelming drowsiness washed over him, and he struggled to keep his eyes open. Gradually, everything faded into pitch-black darkness. In the depths of his mind, panic surged through Chen Daolin as he comprehended that he had been attacked. Thoughts of unfinished business and regrets flooded his consciousness. He reflected on the days he had eagerly anticipated and questioned why he had ever desired to transmigrate to this treacherous new world. Above the frozen forest, thunder rumbled, and lightning illuminated the sky, casting an eerie glow beneath the canopy of trees. Lan Lan cradled Chen Daolin's body, desperately calling out to him over and over again. A fierce determination ignited within her eyes, and she turned toward the direction of the assailants, cursing them in a fit of rage. As the frozen forest was drenched in a torrential downpour, Lan Lan found herself face to face with a horde of beastmen. Determined, she gently laid Chen Dao Lin on the ground and prepared to confront the attackers. In response, the beastmen let out thunderous roars, eagerly awaiting the impending battle. 
Lan Lan's expression transformed into a wild and fierce visage as she gracefully soared into the air, unleashing a barrage of magical arrows upon the horde. The sky crackled with lightning, seemingly mirroring her anger. Her arrows found their mark, striking the vital points of a few enemies. Despite the bow being a long-range weapon, Lan Lan wielded it with remarkable efficiency, even in close combat. However, her adversary proved to be resilient, showing no signs of faltering, even with an arrow lodged in their shoulder. With a ferocious howl, one of them yanked out the arrow and snapped it, brandishing a massive war axe with malicious intent. Yet Lan Lan's agility saved her as she swiftly evaded the heavy blow and promptly drew her dagger, slicing open the beast man's abdomen. At that moment, Lan Lan stood triumphantly over the lifeless body of her fallen foe. Her ruthless counterattack momentarily instilled fear and horror in the remaining beastmen, causing their bodies to tremble. But Lan Lan was far from finished. With a gaze filled with rage, she seized the enemy's weapon and unleashed a dense battle aura fueled by her unyielding fury. In the midst of the ensuing clash, Lan Lan gracefully maneuvered through the battlefield like a battle-hardened Valkyrie, swiftly taking down her adversaries with precision and speed. With each strike, she effortlessly severed both their bodies and weapons, establishing herself as the bringer of death to the Beastmen. Her thirst for blood intensified with every kill until she found herself face to face with a colossal beast man, towering over her like an insurmountable obstacle. This formidable creature regarded her with contempt, criticizing her for her arrogance despite being a mere human. Meanwhile, Chen Dalin remained trapped within the depths of his mind, lost in a state of unconsciousness. As he pondered his whereabouts, a sinking feeling enveloped him, leaving him to question whether he had found himself in heaven or hell. As he gazed into the distance, a dazzling light caught his attention, leaving him questioning his existence. The warmth emanating from the light enveloped him, overpowering his senses, and in the blink of an eye he managed to pry his eyes open. With a sense of urgency, he swiftly surveyed his surroundings, curious about his whereabouts. To his surprise, everything around him seemed to be crafted from wood, and he found himself immersed in a vibrant natural aura. Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder if he had just emerged from an incredibly long dream. As he sat up, a sharp pang of pain shot through his body, causing him to flinch. It was at that moment that he realized the events that had unfolded were undeniably real. Not only was he still alive, but he also noticed that someone had tended to his wound. He pondered if it was Lan Lan who had come to his aid. Suddenly, a wave of panic washed over him and he called out for Lan Lan. In his haste, he accidentally tumbled off the hammock he had been resting on, which seemed to be fashioned from an enormous leaf. Struggling to regain his footing, he heard footsteps approaching drawing his attention towards the doorway. In an instant, his eyes lit up with excitement as he beheld the exquisite features of a young lady who gracefully entered the room adorned with wings and delicate pointed ears. The girl's emerald eyes sparkled with delight as she beamed a bright smile, her blonde hair cascading down her shoulders. She clasped her hands together, expressing her happiness that Chen Daolin had finally awakened. She had been worried that he wouldn't make it. The girl then reported that the young man had been in a coma for six days. With a joyful dance, she celebrated the fact that she had saved a member of the Tulip family, or so she believed. Chen Daolin, however, remained puzzled by her assumption. In an instant, he decided to clear up the misunderstanding and denied any affiliation with the Tulip family. The elf girl immediately countered his statement, pointing to the armor he had been wearing, adorned with the image of a tulip. Lightly poking his bandaged chest, she caused him to panic, fearing that she might draw blood. And indeed, she did. To reassure him, the girl proceeded to wrap his entire body in bandages, much to Chen Daolin's protest that it wasn't necessary. Nonetheless, she was overjoyed that she had managed to stop the bleeding and that no harm had been done. With an eager expression, she urged Chen Daolin to share more about the Tulip family. Chen Daolin lay there, tightly wrapped like a mummy, feeling frustrated as he listened to yet another mention of the Tulip family. Since his transmigration, he hadn't experienced anything positive related to them. Finally, he managed to free himself from the bandages and explained that there was no connection between the flower on his armor and the Tulip family's symbol. The girl chuckled and playfully teased him, wondering if he was afraid of tarnishing the family's prestige by wearing inferior armor. She assured him that she wouldn't tell anyone about it. Chen Daolin found the elf girl to be full of energy and curiosity, so he asked why she was so interested in the Tulip family, considering the historical animosity between elves and humans. The girl explained that she had grown up hearing legends about the family, especially their incredible creations. Human traders would often talk about the Tulip family's cloaks that rivaled the beauty of a sunset, their incredibly smooth silk fabrics, and their bows and arrows that could reach astonishing distances. Furthermore, she had heard rumors of magical wonders within the Tulip family's region. If given the chance, she wouldn't hesitate to visit and experience it all, 
On the other hand, Chen Daolin found all the talk about the family to be overwhelming. It seemed like he had encountered the Tulip family's biggest fan. Chen Daolin made a conscious decision not to shatter her happiness bubble, as she had saved his life. Despite this, he reiterated that he was not a member of the Tulip family. The elf girl pointed out his strong Northwestern accent, which gave away his true identity. Chen Daolin was puzzled by the term Northwesterners, and suddenly remembered Lan Lan. As he inquired about her whereabouts, he exerted too much energy and started bleeding once more. The elf girl was taken aback by his reaction, while Chen Daolin winced in pain, causing his body to tremble. The elf girl then revealed that her tribe's warriors had saved Chen Daolin from the beastmen, finding him alone and severely injured. She was about to share her suspicions when Chen Daolin began to wail uncontrollably, surprising the elf girl. The elf girl, Barossa, tried to comfort Chen Daolin, assuring him that his companion might have escaped from the beastmen's clutches. She explained that the beastmen often carried captives, but since there was no sign of his companion being taken, there was hope. Chen Daolin's spirits lifted at this revelation. With tears in his eyes, he turned to the elf girl and realized that he didn't even know her name. Taking the initiative, he introduced himself. A moment later, Chen Daolin noticed that his backpack was missing and asked Barossa if she had seen it anywhere. To his surprise, Barossa revealed that she had kept it safe for him. However, when she retrieved it, it appeared to be in a sorry state. Barossa explained that it was already like that when she found it. Furthermore, she assured him that she hadn't gone through his belongings, emphasizing that elves were an honest race. When Chen Daolin didn't respond, Barossa grabbed his shoulder, urging him to believe her. He gently pulled her hand away and reassured her that he trusted her. As he examined his belongings, Chen Daolin realized that most of the food had been discarded by the ignorant beastmen. Fortunately, there were still some essential items and emergency medicine left. As he held the backpack in his hand, he noticed that the bar of soap he had shared with Lan Lan was still there. Memories of their tender moments flooded his mind, and he couldn't help but hope that she was safe. However, his thoughts were abruptly interrupted when Barossa let out a piercing shriek. Barossa seemed flustered as she pointed an accusing finger at him, claiming that he had deceived her. She accused him of not being from the Tulip family yet possessing their precious clear frost snow liquid. It took Chen Daolin a moment to understand what she was referring to. He quickly tore open the sachet in his hand and emptied its contents onto his palm, asking if that was what she meant. Clearly frustrated, Barossa couldn't believe how wasteful Chen Daolin was being. With excitement in her eyes, she eagerly asked him how he came to possess so many valuable things. Chen Daolin chuckled in response and presented her with various items from his world, which Barossa immediately recognized and identified their uses. The sheer number of precious items left the girl in awe, while Chen Daolin realized that it didn't matter that he lacked magic or good looks. The fact that he had a pack of shampoo was enough to make her envious. With that in mind, he decided to reward Barossa for saving his life. Chen Daolin extended a generous offer of complimentary items to her, causing her to react with surprise and question his certainty. Without hesitation, Chen Daolin confirmed his offer. Still, before he could mention his intention to sell the remaining goods, Barossa had already dashed off, promising to persuade everyone to make a purchase. It was evident that the pursuit of cleanliness was a shared interest among all civilized races, except perhaps the beast men. Even the proud and simple elves understood the importance of bathing and washing their hair. The elves despised deceit and trickery, and they would never resort to using evil against evil. It was their cooperation that allowed Chen Daolin's plan to unfold seamlessly. Before he knew it, Chen Daolin found himself immersed in a sea of gold and precious gems, feeling as though he had struck the jackpot. Suddenly, the door swung open, and he turned towards it with irritation, annoyed by the interruption. After all, he was still in the midst of counting his money. Barossa's older brother Tata had arrived and requested Chen Daolin's presence, urging him to follow. Tata wanted Chen Daolin to accompany him to meet the clan elder, who expressed a desire to see him. Naturally, Chen Daolin was skeptical, knowing that the clan leader rarely entertained outsiders. Throughout their journey to meet the clan leader, Chen Daolin attempted to engage in conversation, but Barossa's brother remained unresponsive, much to his frustration. As Chen Daolin mindlessly trailed behind, Tata abruptly halted, causing Chen Daolin to collide with him. Without any reaction, Tata declared that they had reached their destination. At that moment, Chen Daolin glanced upwards and was greeted by the sight of a magnificent tree, which made him feel incredibly small. In his astonishment, he couldn't help but wonder if the elder was perched at the top of the tree and how he could ascend to such heights. Tata, in response, clapped twice, and to Chen Daolin's amazement, magical vines descended from the tree. Tata didn't provide much explanation, but advised Chen Daolin to hold on tightly. As soon as Chen Daolin did so, 
he was abruptly pulled into the sky. The sudden rush filled him with terror, causing his pupils to contract and tears to well up in his eyes while he screamed all the way to the top. To him, that magical elevator was absolutely terrifying, and he desperately called out for assistance. In an instant, he vanished into the dense canopy of the colossal tree, only to find himself landing at the entrance of what appeared to be a small dwelling. He felt nauseous, and silently complained in his heart that Barossa's brother had intentionally subjected him to this ordeal. Suddenly, a voice caught his attention, addressing him as a member of the Tulip family and inviting him inside the house. The sheer size of the treehouse left Chen Daolin in awe. As soon as he stepped inside, he passed through a mystical veil. To his surprise, he was greeted by an enchanting sight. The entire house was adorned with a breathtaking sea of flowers, leaving Chen Daolin questioning if he had stumbled into a dream. He stood there in awe, marveling at the existence of such a magical place. However, his attention was quickly captured by a mysterious figure who extended an invitation for him to take a seat. When Chen Daolin turned towards the source of the voice, he was taken aback by the youthful appearance of the elder defying his expectations. The leader of the elf tribe apologized for not meeting Chen Daolin earlier, despite being their leader. Nervously scratching the back of his head, Chen Daolin humbly requested the elder not to be so formal, as it was he who owed a debt of gratitude to the tribe for saving his life. Pouring a drink, the elf leader reassured Chen Daolin that he was being too serious. He explained that the elves cherished life and it was only natural for them to come to the aid of those on the brink of death. After serving the drink, he revealed that it was a particular flower juice brewed by the elves. Observing as Chen Daolin took a sip, the elder suddenly inquired about the progress of his business, causing Chen Daolin to choke on his drink. Panic surged within him, fearing that the leader had discovered his secret of selling subpar goods. Coughing nervously, he couldn't help but feel guilty convinced that the elder had a bone to pick with him. In response, the leader assured him not to worry, assuring him that he had no intention of asking any questions. On the contrary, he had something to ask, seeking the young man's approval. Chen Daolin felt a wave of relief that the elf leader hadn't seen through him yet, and he urged himself to remain calm. With confidence, Chen Daolin asked the leader if there was anything he needed, considering that the leader's tribe had saved his life. The elf leader responded with a severe look and asked if the young man could provide a stable supply if he were to be invited to trade with the tribe. Chen Daolin was taken aback, wondering if the elf leader wanted him to expand his trading volume. He took a moment to ponder, and in his mind, miniature versions of himself appeared. One was an angel, urging him to run away after selling this batch of goods, while the other was a devil, tempting him not to miss out on the opportunity to make money. Deep in thought, the elf leader asked if something was troubling him. Chen Daolin reluctantly replied, stating that he was just an ordinary person and that it was a miracle that he was alive. He expressed that he couldn't afford to die at the moment. The elf leader agreed, advising Chen Daolin to find a companion he could trust. They both acknowledged that there were too many selfish humans out there. These words struck a nerve within Chen Daolin, as they felt too close to the truth. Suddenly, the elf leader asked if the young man trusted his clan before inviting someone to join them. To Chen Daolin's surprise, Barossa, with a bright and cheerful face, appeared. She knelt in greeting to the clan leader, leaving Chen Daolin wondering why she was there with them. He also noticed that Barossa sneaked a glance at him. Before he could delve into further speculation, the elf leader recommended her to him. Chen Daolin couldn't help but feel a mix of confusion and excitement as the elf leader explained the plan. He had always been intrigued by the mysterious human empire, but he had no idea how to get there. However, the thought of exploring the forest with Barossa by his side made him feel a sense of adventure and safety. With a smile on his face, Chen Daolin nodded and agreed to the arrangement. Deep down, he knew that Barossa would go above and beyond to protect him because she considered him a part of the Tulip family. And perhaps along the way, he might even win the heart of this beautiful elf. Just as he thought everything was settled, the elf leader surprised him with a small gift. Wrapped in a dark cloth, it held a special significance to the leader. With a sense of anticipation, Chen Daolin accepted the object, grateful for the warm welcome he had received. The young man held the mysterious dagger in his hand, his curiosity piqued. The elf leader, sensing his wonder, explained that the dagger was blessed with the power of nature and had a unique sensitivity to its surroundings. It would emit a radiant light whenever danger lurked nearby. Chen Daolin suddenly realized that this dagger was akin to a versatile and powerful weapon. In a moment of confusion, Chen Daolin couldn't help but ask why the dagger continued to glow. The elf leader paused for a moment, contemplating the question, before realizing that it was Barossa who had been standing behind him all along. That was the cause of the glowing. Barossa appeared visibly angry, and the elf leader admitted that his subordinate was quite emotional. Suddenly, the dagger responded to the tension in the air. Chen Daolin felt a shiver run down his spine, sensing an evil intent directed towards him. 
He couldn't help but wonder what he had done to provoke such hostility from the girl. Nevertheless, he raised the dagger triumphantly, realizing that he had finally obtained his first magical tool. With a laugh, Chen Dalin declared that he was starting to resemble a true protagonist. Later, he arrived at Barossa's treehouse and knocked on the door. As he entered, he apologized for his tardiness. To his surprise, the girl eagerly pounced on him with excitement in her eyes, thrilled that he had returned. She playfully tackled him to the ground and asked when he would take her away. Lost in thought, Chen Daolin absentmindedly asked where they would be heading. The elf girl, carrying him off, scolded him for pretending not to know when he already did. Their destination was none other than the human hometown in the Roland Empire. Chen Daolin responded promptly, crossing his arms and ignoring any reservations he may have had about the idea. Barossa was taken aback by his sudden reaction, prompting her to question why. Chen Daolin then explained that the elf leader had instructed Barossa to accompany him out of the forest. He further emphasized that if her brother found out about her tagging along, it would create a significant problem. With a self-righteous tone, he warned her about the dangers of the human world, implying that she was unaware of them. Realizing the risks involved, Chen Daolin couldn't allow his savior to take such risks. In fact, he didn't even know how to reach the Roland Empire himself, making it impossible for him to bring her along. Barossa appeared disheartened, but she agreed with the young man's reasoning, acknowledging that it would be unwise to burden her brother with worry. Chen Daolin was surprised by how easily Barossa was convinced, although he found it uncharacteristic of her. Nevertheless, Barossa cheerfully assured Chen Daolin that she would safely escort him out of the forest. She recalled a time in her youth when she had argued with her brother, who discouraged her from venturing beyond the forest. Barossa had questioned why she couldn't explore the outside world like humans did. However, her brother had emphasized their duty to protect the forest, which their ancestors had passed down. As elves, they couldn't prioritize profit as humans did. During those days, Barossa also faced rejection from her kind due to her unusual fondness for humans. And this memory was a painful one for her. She felt a deep sadness, knowing that she was forbidden from interacting with humans. It made her question whether she was making the right choices. After some time, she changed her attire and expressed her gratitude to Chen Daolin for waiting. She assured him that she was prepared to leave whenever he was ready. Her sudden change in demeanor took aback Chen Daolin. He never expected the girl to have such a serious side, especially since she had even changed into her combat uniform. As they ventured through the forest, Chen Daolin couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The dangers lurking within, especially at night, made him anxiously scan their surroundings. He sought reassurance that they wouldn't encounter any unexpected ambushes, similar to their encounter with the Beastmen last time. Barossa casually turned back and reassured him of their safety before turning her attention to a tree. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifted, and streams of cayenne aura enveloped the area, causing the tree to emit a mysterious glow. At that moment, time seemed to stand still, and Chen Daolin found himself captivated by Barossa's beauty. The image of her in that frozen moment was etched into his mind. It appeared as though she was performing a ritual. Afterward, she informed Chen Daolin that the forest plants had relayed a message to her, assuring them that their surroundings were relatively safe. Chen Daolin was impressed by her incredible skills and remarked that it was to be expected from an elf. Barossa blushed, flustered by the compliment. As night fell, they decided to set up camp. Barossa couldn't help but marvel at the burst of flavor that engulfed her taste buds. She was completely taken aback and couldn't resist asking Chen Daolin about the magical seasoning she had just used. Chen Daolin, slightly embarrassed by her reaction, sheepishly admitted that it was just a packet of instant noodle seasoning. However, he quickly redeemed himself by proudly revealing several other seasoning packs, assuring Barossa that there was more where that came from. Barossa was overcome with pure bliss as she savored the delicious noodles. She couldn't believe that something so simple could taste so incredible. At that moment, Chen Daolin couldn't help but find her adorable, even though all she was doing was enjoying a meal. Barossa had never been happier while eating, and she expressed her heartfelt gratitude to Chen Daolin. Chen Daolin was captivated by Barossa's overwhelmingly cute reaction. He was taken aback when she suddenly changed her tone and acknowledged the remarkable capabilities of humans. As she gazed at the moonlight, she confessed that despite their physical weaknesses compared to other races, humans possessed an infinite wisdom to create extraordinary inventions. In contrast, the elves relied solely on their natural talents and clung stubbornly to outdated beliefs, isolating themselves from the outside world. Barossa questioned whether her race was ignorant for lacking understanding and living solely for their pride. Despite their long lifespans of thousands of years, the elves' spirit of exploration and curiosity paled in comparison to that of humans, who had less than a hundred years to live. Barossa's heart always danced with excitement whenever human traders arrived at her tribe, bringing with them a myriad of strange and fascinating objects. She couldn't help but feel a deep longing for the unknown wonders that lay beyond her home. 
Despite her kin's lack of understanding, she yearned to break free from the limitations of her kind and explore all the mysteries that awaited her. After a satisfying meal, a sense of isolation weighed heavily on her mind. With a heavy heart, she masked her genuine emotions behind a mask of optimism, contemplating the striking contrast between herself and the arrogant elves they had encountered on their journey. The time for parting drew near, and Barossa pointed out their proximity to their destination, signaling the end of her mission. However, to her surprise, Chen Daolin proposed that she continue to accompany him, his determination unwavering. In response to his unexpected request, Barossa hesitated, questioning the sincerity of his words. The young man reassured her, promising to be her guide on the condition that she followed his lead. As he instructed her to freshen up, Barossa eagerly sprinted towards the lake for a quick bath, while Chen Daolin scoured the woods in search of the elusive transdimensional door. When he stumbled upon the precise location, he extended his arms, and a radiant outline of a tulip illuminated the air before the door abruptly materialized out of nothingness. Barossa was immersed in the lake enjoying a bath when she suddenly caught wind of Chen Daolin's voice. Instantly, panic surged through her veins as she pleaded for him to keep his distance, reminding him of his promise to wait. Concealing himself behind a nearby tree, his back turned away from the lake. Chen Daolin expressed remorse for deceiving her and proposed that they bid farewell. At that moment, Barossa was left dumbfounded. Chen Daolin clarified that he genuinely yearned to be with her, as he believed they were kindred spirits, individuals who refused to settle for the ordinary and craved to forge their destinies. He confessed that he had entered this world driven by the same impulse, seeking a companion who shared his aspirations. This, he believed, would make their journey all the more captivating. However, it saddened him to admit that he lacked the strength to embark on adventures with her. As tears welled up in Barossa's eyes, Chen Daolin presented a proposition. Once he returned, stronger than ever, he would take her on a voyage across the globe, allowing her to fulfill her dreams. Finally, he inquired whether she would welcome him back upon his return. Amidst her tearful state, Barossa sobbed, labeling him as foolish. As Chen Daolin unlocked the transdimensional door, he warmly reminded her to stay positive and motivated in life, then requested her to wait for him patiently. Chen Daolin couldn't contain his excitement as he stepped back into the original world and glanced at his bank account. A proud smile spread across his face as he realized he had earned a staggering sum of 1.3 million won. The profits from selling elven goods had indeed paid off, and now he was eager to indulge himself in some well-deserved treats, particularly seafood. Little did he know that his jubilant demeanor had caught the attention of curious onlookers, who found him rather peculiar. As Chen Daolin strolled through the bustling commercial street of the city, he couldn't help but reminisce. He had never been able to afford anything before, which made this experience all the more exhilarating. The array of shops overwhelmed him, leaving him unsure of where to begin. He reminded himself to stay composed and avoid getting carried away in a shopping frenzy. His rationality was put to the test when his stomach growled loudly, reminding him of his hunger. Unable to resist the temptation, he dashed down the street in search of something to eat. All thoughts of reason vanished as he arrived at a fast food restaurant and joined the queue, eagerly waiting to be served. In the past, he had been accustomed to a simple breakfast of vegetable buns and white porridge. However, now that he had the means to splurge, he decided to let loose and ordered two portions of fries. The sheer joy of indulging in an endless supply of fries was beyond words. With his stomach pleasantly full, he reveled in the freedom that came with having enough money to fulfill his desires. As he was just about to indulge in more of his ice cream, disaster struck. It plopped right onto his shirt, leaving him fuming. Initially, he decided to rush back home to clean up the mess, but then he had a change of heart. Realizing he had been wearing the same old clothes for years, he figured it was high time for a wardrobe upgrade now that he was financially capable. Off he went to a fancy clothing store, splurging on some designer labels. Stepping into such high-end stores was a whole new experience for him, making him feel like his life had taken a complete turn. Despite overspending a bit more than planned, he managed to calm his nerves and stay focused on his ultimate goal for the day. With newfound wealth, his next mission was to purchase a new home and live in comfort. He was eager to bid farewell to his shabby rented house. However, browsing through real estate listings left him shocked at the skyrocketing prices. Frustrated and angry, he couldn't believe how unaffordable houses had become. He vented his frustration at the real estate agency, feeling like all his hard work to earn money had gone to waste. Needing a breather, he headed to the park to unwind on that scorching day. Suddenly he heard cries for help and saw two kids, a boy and a girl, playing together. The little girl, dressed as an elf with cardboard wings, had won their game. Unable to resist, he jokingly pointed out that elves were known to be messy and opposed to baths. Chen Daolin couldn't help but chuckle at the sight of the fake elf wings, which reminded him of Barossa's infectious smile. However, 
His amusement was short-lived when the little girl in front of him called him a scumbag and whisked her brother away, cautioning her sibling about talking to strangers. Chen Dalin felt a pang of guilt at the girl's words, but he brushed it off, realizing the innocence of the children. The park was abuzz with activity, and snippets of conversations floated around him. One particular exchange caught his attention, a person dreaming of hitting the jackpot and becoming rich overnight, only to be shot down by their companion. The conversation struck a chord with Chen Daolin. Later, he freshened up in the men's washroom, contemplating the frustrations of not having enough money as he stared at his reflection in the mirror. Now that he had some money in his pocket, new worries crept in. It was true what they said. More money, more problems. A man emerged from a bathroom stall, engaging in a calm conversation with his boss about his upcoming fatherhood and the challenges of balancing work and home life. Simultaneously, a young man entered the bathroom. He leaned against a wall, shedding tears of grief and frustration, as his partner had recently left him. Venting his anger by kicking the bin, he was consumed by the fact that his partner would not forgive him. Observing the contrasting circumstances of the two men before him, Chen Daolin was lost in contemplation, recognizing that he too harbored worries like any ordinary person. Despite his self-criticism for his inability to protect those he held dear, Chen Daolin remained resolute in his determination to work tirelessly for their well-being. His priorities were clear. Material possessions such as a luxurious house, fine dining, or stylish attire paled in comparison to the importance of cherished relationships. These significant individuals were not physically close, yet their presence was felt deeply within his heart. Reflecting on the memories shared with Lan Lan, Chen Daolin realized that the decision to pursue or relinquish their connection rested solely with him. Confident in his ability to navigate the complexities of life, he understood that he held the power to shape his destiny. Unperturbed by past losses, he embraced the belief that the world was his for the taking, should he choose to seize it. With a sense of assurance, the young man gazed at his palm, reassured by the knowledge that he was not alone. He was encouraged by the unwavering support of those who awaited his return. A week had gone by in the icy depths of the forest. Deep within the thick foliage, a mysterious rustling sound emerged from the bushes, capturing the attention of a curious beast. It cautiously approached a peculiar object lying on the ground, only to be startled by a sudden blur of movement. In an instant, a figure darted behind a sturdy tree trunk, evading the beast's gaze. As the beast turned towards the direction of the figure, ready to pounce, a hand firmly grasped a trigger. The owner of the hand, Chen Daolin, realized that he had been discovered. Without hesitation, he unleashed a barrage of projectiles towards the beast, transforming it into a pincushion. Chen Daolin then picked up the can he had used as bait, reminding himself not to bring such tempting meat cans next time, as they were easily stolen and attracted troublesome creatures. Determined to find Barossa as soon as possible, Chen Daolin activated a vibrant green flare that soared into the sky, illuminating the surroundings like a dazzling fireworks display. Suddenly, a voice called out to him from within the forest, urging him to hide. Simultaneously, the elven dagger he possessed emitted a pulsating light, warning him of imminent danger. Chen Daolin immediately recognized the voice as Barossa's and grew alarmed when he heard a menacing howl emanating from the same direction. If his memory served him correctly, the howl definitely did not come from an ordinary creature. His heart pounded as he watched Barossa in danger deep within the forest, her figure moving swiftly as she evaded the pursuing beast man. As she drew her final arrow from the quiver, the beast man skillfully dodged it. When she released the arrow, she realized she was out of ammunition. The beast man let out a howl and brandished a large sword with deadly intent. Barossa, a skilled warrior, reacted quickly by using her bow to block the beast man's mount's open jaws just in time. Although she managed to fend off the mount's attack with her bow temporarily, it used its immense strength to throw her against a nearby tree stump, causing her to sustain injuries and spit out blood. The resemblance between the beast man and his mount was uncanny. With his massive blade resting on his shoulder, the beast man loomed over Barossa, expressing his annoyance at the hide-and-seek game she was playing. In the blink of an eye, Barossa was back on her feet, but the beast man dismounted and warned her not to test his patience. Gripping her neck tightly, he demanded the truth about the captured beast men. Barossa looked helpless as she coughed, trapped in the beast man's claws. Despite the threat, she showed her determination by claiming ignorance of what he was referring to. And so, she granted him the freedom to do as he pleased. The defiance in Barossa's words infuriated the beast man, who declared that his patience had finally run out. As he spoke, a sinister gleam appeared in his eyes. With Barossa held captive in one hand, he raised his blade, vowing to strike her down swiftly since she was a warrior. As he prepared to end her life then and there, Barossa closed her eyes. Resigned to her fate, she braced herself. However, a small bag flew towards the beast man, almost catching him off guard. 
Reacting quickly, he slashed at it while dismissing it as a feeble trick. Little did he know, things were not as simple as they seemed. A cloud of red powder descended upon the beast man, causing his eyes to burn. The pain was so unbearable that he howled in agony while clutching his eyes. Even his mount was not spared from this unexpected turn of events, which left Barossa astonished. Seizing the opportunity, Chen Daolin swiftly approached, donning goggles and a mask for protection. With precision, Chen Daolin aimed his crossbow at the beast man and unleashed a volley of bolts that pierced his torso. The beast man cried out in pain, collapsing to the ground as he struggled to catch his breath. Chen Daolin was astounded by the true power of high-end items worth 20,000 yuan. In a desperate attempt to retaliate, the beast man tightly gripped his sword and lunged towards his new adversary with a fierce howl. But with quick reflexes, Chen Daolin evaded the attack, narrowly avoiding the large blade that became embedded in a nearby tree trunk. Trembling, he realized just how close of a call it had been. Realizing he was utterly outmatched by the beast man and had no chance of winning, Chen Daolin pulled out another item from his pocket. He couldn't help but notice that the pepper powder he had used earlier had temporarily impaired his opponent's senses of sight and smell. This presented an opportunity for him to take advantage of the creature's panic and launch a surprise attack. The item he held in his hand was an electric baton, a tool whose power he was itching to put to the test. With a swift and calculated movement, he maneuvered himself to the side of the beast man, aiming directly for a vulnerable spot. With all his might, he struck the beast man's sensitive area, causing a bone-chilling sound of cracking eggshells to fill the air. The beast man convulsed in agony as electricity surged through its body, collapsing to the ground and clutching its head in pain. Chen Daolin, seizing the opportunity, wasted no time. He knew he had to finish things off to prevent any future troubles. Determined, he reached for his dagger, ready to deliver the final blow. However, to his surprise, the beast man's mount, though still affected by the pepper powder, stood in his way. Although its vision hadn't fully recovered, the mount's instinct to protect its master was deeply ingrained. Chen Daolin took a moment to observe the wolf's fierce determination, realizing that it would be futile to continue his attack. With a sigh of resignation, he decided to let the mount be, knowing that at least part of his plan had succeeded. At that moment, he firmly grasped Barossa's hand, urging her to follow him. Swiftly, he led her through the dense forest, only coming to a halt once they had reached a safe distance where he noted that they appeared to have successfully evaded their pursuers. Barossa, meanwhile, struggled to catch her breath. Simultaneously, she expressed gratitude for Chen Daolin's assistance. Initially failing to recognize him, she watched as he removed his goggles and gazed at her with kind eyes before introducing himself. Barossa was taken aback, studying his face intently before her eyes widened and a deep blush spread across her cheeks. Her complexion turned a deep shade of crimson, and she slapped Chen Daolin, labeling him as impertinent. The sudden outburst startled the birds perched in the nearby trees. With her hand still raised, Barossa paused, lost in thought. Chen Dalin, looking slightly bewildered, inquired as to why she had struck him so suddenly. Barossa took a deep breath before unleashing a torrent of reprimands, denouncing Chen Dalin as a deplorable individual. Her voice rang out, piercing and forceful, causing the young man to cover his ears in response. Once her anger had subsided, Chen Dalin removed the earplugs. He was visibly irritated as he demanded an explanation for her outburst, cautioning against the risk of alerting the werewolf to their presence. The moment he looked into Barossa's tearful eyes, his own widened in surprise. The girl standing before him had suddenly burst into sobs. With genuine concern, he softly called out to her. However, instead of a comforting response, Barossa clenched her teeth and complained about waiting for him in the forest, only to be left disappointed. Amidst her tears, she even called him an idiot, questioning whether he understood just how worried she had been for him. He patiently listened as Barossa continued to express her fear and anxiety after he had left without a trace. Before she could say anything else, attempting to wipe away her tears, Chen Dalin surprised her by apologizing. Moving closer to her, he promised never to make her scared again and vowed to always be by her side. He sincerely apologized for causing her suffering and pleaded with her not to be angry anymore. However, Rosa was taken aback by the whirlwind of emotions within her. She couldn't help but notice that Dalin seemed different from before, and a faint blush began to bloom on her cheeks. Her thoughts were interrupted when Chen Daolin asked if something was wrong, as her face had suddenly turned crimson. Barossa's body trembled slightly as she realized she needed to calm down, and in a moment of frustration, she covered her face and ran away, calling him an idiot for his nonsensical words. Chen Daolin tried to stop her, but then he noticed something. His gaze fell upon a small bruise on one of Barossa's wings. It was at that moment that he realized she was hurt. Without hesitation, he offered his help in tending to her wounds. Timidly, Barossa insisted that there was no need, as her race possessed the ability to heal themselves quickly. However, Chen Daolin was determined to assist her, and eventually, 
Barbarossa reluctantly agreed. While tending to her wounds, Chen Daolin inquired about the sudden attack from the wolf. Barossa immediately blamed Chen Daolin's absence, which prompted her to search for him. She clarified that the beast man was only interested in the prisoner's whereabouts. Furthermore, if he had intended to kill her, there would have been no chance of escape. Chen Daolin, with a hint of arrogance, dismissed the beast man's power. He assured Barossa that there would be no issues as long as he was by her side. Barossa couldn't help but wonder where Chen Daolin's confidence stemmed from. She proceeded to explain that the werewolf was no ordinary creature. Its physique was more robust than other werewolves, and its golden hair symbolized its lineage as the Wolf King. Its strength should not be underestimated. Soon after, Chen Daolin declared that he had finished treating her, neatly wrapping her injured wings like a ribbon. Barossa was stunned by this gesture. However, Chen Daolin justified it by saying the ribbon looked adorable on her. He then attempted some lighthearted flattery, urging Barossa to smile more because she was a beautiful girl. His words caused a rosy hue to spread across her cheeks unconsciously. Turning towards him, she flashed a sweet smile and nodded, feeling a sense of comfort deep within her. The tender moment was abruptly cut short when Barossa noticed something that drained all color from her face. Out of nowhere, the beast man from earlier emerged behind Chen Daolin, poised to launch a deadly surprise attack. Chen, still preoccupied with reassuring her about his ability to handle any upcoming challenges, was caught off guard when Barossa urgently warned him to dodge. As the beast man's blade swiftly descended, he demanded to know what tricks Chen had up his sleeve. Thankfully, Barossa managed to shove Chen out of harm's way just in time. With a safe distance between them, Chen decided to face the beast man head on, realizing he was out of options. Letting out a fierce battle cry, Chen charged at the werewolf, who sneered in response. Despite his initial disdain, the werewolf begrudgingly admitted that Chen wasn't half bad. Caught off guard, the beast man stumbled and fell. In a surprising turn of events, Chen shamelessly prostrated himself before the werewolf addressing him respectfully as Sir Werewolf and begging for forgiveness for their past transgressions, pleading for their lives. Although taken aback by Chen's audacity, the werewolf rose to his feet once more, scolding the young man for his shameless behavior. Undeterred, Chen offered to cook a delicious meal for the beast man, much to Barossa's surprise and disbelief. Questioning whether Chen's only trick was surrender, Barossa realized he had underestimated the young man. The werewolf, still seething from the humiliation, demanded to know if a mere apology was enough to make amends. Chen Daolin shivered slightly, realizing that he might be in trouble because the werewolf seemed determined to make things difficult. With a hesitant breath, he decided to take a risk and use his final trump card. These words piqued Barossa's interest, making her wonder what he had up his sleeve. To her amazement, the young man proudly displayed his trusty dog whistle. This item had been highly recommended by the owner of the travel tool store that Chen Daolin had visited in his world. The seller had assured him that the whistle was versatile and could drive away beasts by emitting an ultrasonic wave that only animals couldn't tolerate but was harmless to humans. Chen Daolin slowly raised the whistle to his lips as his opponent readied his sword for an attack. Barossa, fearing for his safety, closed her eyes and urged him to move. However, just before the massive sword could strike, Chen Daolin blew the whistle. He continued to blow into it, causing the beast man to freeze momentarily. Barossa watched in astonishment as the beast man stumbled back, howling in pain from the piercing sound. Unable to bear it any longer, he then fled into the distance, leaving the elf girl curious about what had just transpired. With a confident smile, Chen Daolin explained his actions. Reminding her of his earlier claim of having a secret weapon, he assured Barossa that it was now his turn to protect her. Suddenly, several figures emerged from the bushes and charged towards them. Daolin and Barossa tensed, realizing that the werewolf's reinforcements had arrived. They were left unsure of what to do next. The beast men were not just backup for their foe, but were actually hunting them down. Barossa signaled for Chen Daolin to stay quiet as they hid in the bushes, puzzled by why the wolves were targeting the golden-haired individual. Suddenly, the intruders charged aggressively for an attack. As they remained hidden, Barossa pondered their next move since staying there was no longer an option. Chen Daolin suggested slipping away once both sides were weakened. In a surprising twist, one of the beast mounts was thrown across the battlefield and crashed into a tree trunk, causing something to fall loudly from the branches above. This noise caught the attention of the beast men, who then focused their gaze on Chen Daolin. They began to chase him while he tried to reason with them that they could be allies. If not, they should ignore his presence. Luckily, Barossa intervened and swiftly took down his pursuer. The beast men quickly assumed that the humans were working with their target. Chen Daolin then played his trump card once again, this time asking the golden-haired werewolf to cover his ears as they teamed up. After all, the enemy of their enemy was their friend. The werewolf agreed and instructed the boy to use the whistle. 
With Chen Daolin's assistance, the Wolfman was able to defeat his pursuers, though not fatally. He clarified that it was a last resort and turned away, remembering that despite the Wolf Clan's rule against killing mounts, his brother had not been spared. Chen Daolin was puzzled by the situation. The duo discovered that the Golden Werewolf's mount had been killed during the confrontation. When Chen Daolin inquired about the Beast Man's sorrow, Barossa clarified that it was a Wolf Clan tradition for siblings who were more closely related to their ancestral forms to serve as mounts. Indeed, the mounts of the Wolf Clan warriors were always their brothers. This was the reason for their companion's sadness. The wolf's howl reverberated through the forest that day. Each echo struck Chen Daolin's heart, making him wonder if the werewolf's brother was responding to him. Later, Chen Daolin offered to tend to the wolfman's wounds. As they made their way to a creek, he introduced himself and Barossa. The wolfman revealed his name as Ray. Barossa, however, was frightened and sought refuge behind a tree. Ray appeared slightly annoyed and reassured Barossa that there was no animosity between them. He explained that there was no need for her to be afraid and likened the words of the wolf warriors to iron. A mishap with an antiseptic caused the tough wolfman to yelp, prompting a chuckle from Barossa. This caught the attention of the others. When Barossa looked at them questioningly, Ray complimented her smile warmly, and Chen Daolin encouraged her to come out from hiding. During the dark hours of the night, Chen Daolin couldn't help but question why Ray was being relentlessly pursued by his clan members. To his surprise, Ray disclosed that he was a direct descendant of the royal family of the Wolf Clan, one of the three esteemed leaders of the Beastmen. The lineage of Lord Dominus, a formidable figure among the Beastmen, flowed through Ray's veins. Tragically, Ray's ancestors had perished in a war over a century ago, leaving behind no other descendants who possessed the extraordinary strength required to carry on their legacy. Over time, Lord Tong Hu, the current ruler of the Beastmen, had cunningly manipulated and coerced the leaders of other tribes, consolidating power in his own hands. Ray's revelation unveiled the reason behind his relentless pursuit. His very existence posed a threat to Lord Tong Hu's dominion. Regrettably, Ray found himself powerless in the face of this dangerous situation. In the days that followed, Chen Daolin eagerly absorbed Ray's knowledge of essential martial arts, gaining invaluable insights into the world they inhabited. The three of them coexisted harmoniously, enveloped in a delicate atmosphere of camaraderie. Before long, Chen Daolin even mastered the art of splitting soft stones. However, the time for farewells was fast approaching. Chen Daolin, with a heavy heart, presented Ray with a cherished knife, its value estimated to be at least 10,000 gold. As he bid his friend goodbye, Chen Daolin noticed a stubborn determination in Ray's eyes, making it clear that he could not be swayed from his path. Though parting ways with Ray was a sorrowful affair, Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder if their paths would ever cross again. On the flip side, Ray had bestowed upon him something he had always yearned for, a mystical storage bag. Chen Daolin felt invincible with this bag, envisioning all the incredible treasures he could bring along. Driven by curiosity, he even attempted to squeeze his head into the bag to unravel its secrets. However, Barossa quickly cautioned him, warning that he would suffocate and scolding him for his foolishness. Days passed, and Chen Daolin remained captivated by his newfound storage bag, leaving Barossa to wonder when he would finally divert his attention elsewhere. It seemed as though he hadn't heard her at all, prompting her to raise her voice and snap him out of his trance. Barossa turned away, tears welling up in her eyes, clearly hurt by being ignored. Chandeline realized that he must have deeply upset her and knew he needed to apologize. Later, he quietly slipped into his sleeping bag and gradually inched closer to her side. Once he was beside her, he pondered his next move. Feeling utterly clueless and desperate to break the uncomfortable silence, Chen Daolin was taken aback when Barossa took the initiative and questioned his presence. The young man awkwardly chuckled and apologized for his previous actions. Tearfully, Barossa explained that she wasn't angry about that incident. In fact, she revealed that despite all they had been through, she feared there would always be an insurmountable barrier between them. Even though she made an effort to comprehend him, they remained distanced. With tears streaming down her face, she pondered if this was the extent of their connection. Chen Daolin, however, refuted this notion and urged her to gaze at the stars above before recounting a tale of star-crossed lovers who were unable to be together in their lifetime due to familial obligations. Yet in death, they transformed into celestial bodies, eternally meeting on Chinese Valentine's Day in the vast expanse of the Milky Way. Chen Daolin shared how this story made him contemplate the anguish of only being able to reunite once a year amidst the stars. He then professed that if he found someone he cherished, he would never let her go and would hold her tightly in his embrace. He apologized for his previous emotional distance and vowed never to miss the opportunity to be with the most beautiful star under the enchanting night sky. The silence made him wonder if Barossa had fallen asleep. When he received no response, he decided to retire for the night. It was then that Barossa confessed she was still awake and blushed as she inquired if he had more stories to share. 
Despite her difficulty in falling asleep, she yearned to hear more. Chen Daolin eagerly sat up and asked what kind of story the girl desired. And so, he embarked on a tale about a knight and a saintess. By the end of the narrative, Barossa was overcome with tears, questioning why there had been so many misunderstandings between the characters. Her emotional reaction surprised Chen Daolin, as he felt he had only just begun to tell the story. Sitting side by side on the log near the crackling campfire, he poured out the entire tragic love story to her, and she, in turn, listened intently to the heartbreaking tale. Finally, as the story came to an end, Chen Daolin gently urged Barossa not to dwell on it too much. She silently agreed, nodding her head. But then, out of the blue, she turned to Chen Daolin and made a heartfelt request. She wanted him to answer honestly, to give her a sincere response to the question she was about to ask. The young man was taken aback, but he encouraged her to go ahead. Barossa's eyes were filled with determination as she wondered if Chen Daolin honestly had feelings for her. Caught off guard, the young man's face became flushed and his expression turned blank. With a perplexed look on his face, Chen Daolin struggled to comprehend her question. Barossa repeated it, drawing closer to him. At that moment, his mind raced as he gazed at her soft lips, wondering if she was being serious. She was so close, and he couldn't help but ponder what he should do. Her proximity disrupted his clear thoughts, making it difficult for him to think straight. His momentary hesitation caused Barossa's eyes to well up with tears as she wondered what was going through his mind. Unfortunately, Chen Daolin stumbled over his words, inwardly panicking. He couldn't help but wonder if all the girls in this world were as bold as her. Deep down, he wished she would act a bit more immature. As he pondered the situation, he realized just how beautiful Barossa was. In his world, she would have always been surrounded by people, especially admirers. He couldn't believe that such a stunning girl, someone he would never have had a chance with, had just confessed her feelings to him. This was an incredible moment, but he couldn't help but feel hesitant. However, he mustered up the courage to embrace her, questioning why she had brought it up so suddenly. Before he could even respond to her, thoughts of Lan Lan unexpectedly flooded his mind, catching him off guard. Lan Lan was the warmth he had encountered when he first entered this world, and now he couldn't help but wonder where she was. Even after being apart for so long, he still longed for her. He imagined her as a loving wife who would prepare meals for him every night when he returned home. It was at that moment that he realized he was facing a dilemma. Barossa was also a lovely girl, someone he considered out of his league. As he realized the inappropriate thoughts he was having, Chen Daolin felt disturbed and disgusted with himself. He knew he had to gather his courage and seize the opportunity. After all, he was a man who carried the dreams of all aspiring transmigrators. However, his thoughts were interrupted by Barossa, who asked him what was bothering him. After a brief moment of collecting his thoughts, he attempted to give a weak answer, only to be called a liar by Barossa. She accused him of being lost in his thoughts just moments ago, clearly implying that he was thinking about someone else. With tears in her eyes, Barossa told him that he didn't need to lie because she recognized that look. It was the same look her brother had whenever he thought about his lover. Chen Daolin vehemently denied any thoughts about someone else, but the girl wasn't convinced. Barossa proposed a magical oath, using elven magic, to test his honesty. She warned him that if he lied, his soul would be consumed by magical flames. Caught off guard, Chen Daolin stumbled over his words before finally confessing. With a somber expression, he admitted that he had indeed been thinking about someone else. He revealed that it was his former companion, and explained that he had been with Barossa since being separated from Lan Lan. There was an uncomfortable silence, and Barossa remarked that everything now made sense. She mentioned that her brother had warned her about humans being deceitful, and cautioned her to be wary of guys like Chen Dalin. He tried to defend himself, insisting that he had only thought about his companion. Barossa turned to him with a stern look, and asked if the companion was a woman and if she was close to him. Seeing his hesitation, she accused him of being a liar and declared that she would never trust him again. Chen Daolin desperately apologized for his dishonesty and attempted to explain that things weren't as they seemed. Barossa gave him a piercing gaze and demanded an explanation, stating that he had never looked at her in that way. After what felt like a heated argument, Barossa decided it was best for them to go to bed and calm down. However, that night was filled with restlessness for both of them. Chen Daolin scolded himself for being foolish and the next day arrived quickly. They continued their journey to the elf tribe, but the tension between them remained. As Chen Daolin continued on the journey, he purposefully avoided any mention or discussion of the events and conversations from the previous night. Little did he know, this only served to make the atmosphere even more uncomfortable than he could have ever imagined. However, their discomfort was soon interrupted as they came across the guards of the elf tribe who graciously guided them to their destination. Upon arrival, Chen Daolin couldn't help but express his awe at the breathtaking settlement before him. 
At that moment, he couldn't help but wonder if he had stumbled upon heaven itself. As he surveyed the area, he noticed that the elves were bustling about, preparing what appeared to be a grand welcome ceremony. The liveliness of the place filled him with a sense of joy, especially when he considered that all of this was being done in his honor. However, a hint of skepticism lingered in his mind as he doubted whether they could know the exact time of his arrival. As they ventured further into the settlement, Chen Daolin couldn't help but inquire about the elves' amiable nature towards humans and the extravagant welcome they were bestowing upon him. Barossa, in response, explained that their arrival coincided with the visit of some esteemed guests from the Tulip family, a group of human traders. At that moment, everything clicked for Chen Daolin. He realized that all of this grandeur was not solely for his sake, but rather a gesture of goodwill towards the Tulip family. It made perfect sense, considering the long-standing positive relationship between the elves and the Tulip family. With this realization, he couldn't help but hope for the opportunity to meet the young man from the Tulip family. Suddenly, a strange premonition washed over him, accompanied by the sight of silver strands of hair dancing in the wind. Chen Daolin's attention was then captured by a soft, feminine voice calling out to him, causing him to turn in surprise. Looking up, he recognized the familiar silhouette of a girl perched on a tree branch, leaving him bewildered as to how such a sight could be possible. Perched high on a tree branch stood Lan Lan, her figure exuding a mix of emotions as she finally laid eyes on him. With a leap, she descended from the tree, prompting Chen Daolin to instinctively run towards her, expressing his joy at her return and how much he had missed her. However, his happiness was short-lived as Lan Lan, consumed by anger and frustration from her arduous search, delivered a vicious slap to Chen Daolin, leaving him stunned and bewildered. The unexpected turn of events also left Barossa shocked and flustered. Before Chen Daolin could react, Lan Lan swiftly stole a kiss, leaving him wide-eyed and astonished. The passionate encounter left Chen Daolin in a daze, only to be brought back to reality by the curious gazes of nearby elves who had witnessed the scene. Seizing Chen Daolin's hand, Lan Lan urged him to follow her, leading him away from the prying eyes of onlookers. As they walked through the forest, Chen Daolin couldn't help but glance back at Barossa's retreating figure. Lan Lan, still slightly flushed, inquired about his well-being during their time apart. Lost in the moment, Chen Daolin was still reeling from the unexpected kiss feeling a mix of happiness and confusion. Lan Lan, noticing his distraction, urged him to focus and revealed that she had been injured while searching for him. She had been waiting, hoping for their reunion. Before the conversation could continue, Chen Daolin noticed someone approaching. The individual requested Chen Daolin's presence as the elder wished to speak with him. This elf happened to be Barossa's elder brother, displaying an expressionless face and a cold glint in his eyes. Chen Daolin suspected that the matter might be related to Barossa, Inside the elder's treehouse, an older man sat alongside a gray-haired young man wearing a monocle, who acknowledged Chen Daolin's presence upon hearing about him. The young man with the monocle, known as Mr. Gaian, served as the manager of the Tulip family's workshop. Lan Lan took the opportunity to introduce Chen Daolin to Mr. Gaian as the companion she had been seeking. Mr. Gaian considered Chen Daolin fortunate to have escaped the beast men, with Chen Daolin humbly crediting Lan Lan for looking after him. In a surprising turn of events, Lan Lan took a deep breath and revealed to Mr. Gaian that Chen Daolin was actually her fiancé. This revelation led to a teacup crashing to the floor, capturing everyone's attention. The young man responsible for the mishap sheepishly pointed to himself, prompting Lan Lan to confirm her statement. Mr. Gaian, with a serious demeanor, emphasized to Lan Lan the gravity of her words and questioned the truth behind them. He also highlighted the potential repercussions of Lan Lan's actions, urging her to reconsider her announcement. Mr. Gaian observed the young girl with a discerning gaze as her hands trembled. At that moment, Chen Daolin stepped forward and confidently took hold of Lan Lan's hand, much to her surprise. He then addressed Mr. Gaian, stating that although he was unsure of the situation at hand, as Lan Lan's partner, he would stand by her side if any issues arose. Chen Daolin's eyes exuded determination as he gently but firmly held Lan Lan's hand, causing a slight blush to appear on her cheeks. After a brief pause, Mr. Gaian expressed his genuine admiration for Chen Daolin and wished the couple all the happiness in the world, promising to keep their conversation confidential. As Chen Daolin and Lan Lan departed, Mr. Gian made a passing remark about the earlier events, expressing his concern over Lan Lan's shocking behavior. He feared that if the temple were to discover the truth, dire consequences would follow. In the serene surroundings of the elf courtyard, Lan Lan and Chen Daolin found solace next to each other. Chen Daolin marveled at the beauty of the place, while Lan Lan described it as a sanctuary for reflection and tranquility. Under the night sky, Lan Lan inquired if Chen Daolin had any questions for her, 
He admitted to feeling perplexed by the unusual events that had transpired earlier, acknowledging his shortcomings and feeling unworthy of someone as extraordinary as Lan Lan. He found himself in a state of bewilderment and wonder, as he couldn't believe his luck stumbling upon such a treasure. Lan Lan hesitated for a moment before abruptly rising to her feet and taking a few determined steps forward. She declared that Chen Daolin had always been the one telling stories, but now it was her turn. Within the temple, a long-standing tradition existed where young boys and girls with untarnished backgrounds were chosen and trained as candidates for a unique role, the Chosen One. Eventually, Lan Lan was selected as the Soul Saint. However, amidst the sacred halls of the temple, she found herself devoid of light and devoid of a future. In her solitude, she found solace in the freedom that birds possessed. Despite their fleeting existence, birds had the freedom to soar through the skies. Lan Lan couldn't comprehend why she was bound to a life of servitude within the temple, and why she had to conform to the expectations and affections of others. All she yearned for was an escape, but it remained elusive. Her elders assured her that with time, the weight of responsibility would grow on her, and that love and being loved would come through cultivation. However, they failed to acknowledge that hatred could also be cultivated in the same manner. Lan Lan confessed that she was the chosen saint, and the consequences would be dire if the temple were to discover her secret. Chen Daolin's response caught her off guard. He didn't believe the situation warranted such severity, boldly stating that he could handle the temple if it came down to it. However, when Lan Lan mentioned the possibility of his death, the young man's demeanor suddenly changed. Fear gripped him as Lan Lan explained the gruesome fate that awaited him, being burned at the stake, with not even his bones left behind. Chen Daolin couldn't help but envision himself in that horrifying scenario, realizing the true terror of it all. As Lan Lan continued to describe the other ways the temple could bring about his demise, he began to question the holiness of the organization. He experienced a moment of panic, believing that his fate was sealed, and his reaction caused Lan Lan to burst into laughter. She couldn't help but giggle, feeling a sense of joy. Turning towards him, she suggested that he could still escape, as the temple's power would crush them like ants. Furthermore, if he left, the temple would not harm her. To her surprise, the young man expressed his unwavering determination to stay. His following words made Lan Lan feel flattered. He declared that he would stand by her side through thick and thin because she was his wife. Lan Lan turned away with a small smile, playfully calling him a fool. She confessed that she had been delighted during their time together, and because Chen Daolin was a good man, she no longer wanted to hide anything. She mentioned how fate always played tricks on people, and how she couldn't escape the symbol of the Tulip family for the rest of her life. As she spoke, she envisioned the Tulip as a representation of her struggles. Lan Lan glanced at him and expressed her desire to live in the present moment. Before bidding Chen Daolin goodnight, she asked him not to worry about their conversation. This left Chen Daolin seething with anger, thinking about the tulips who were causing difficulties in Lan Lan's life. In his original world, he wouldn't have taken any action. However, in this new world, he was determined to show the tulip family what a proper counterattack looked like. He vowed never to let anyone harm Lan Lan again. The following day, Chen Daolin strolled through the elf tribe's settlement, Enjoying the pleasant air and the cheerful atmosphere that surrounded him, he felt a sense of calm as he arrived at the tribe's camp. Before long, the members of the tribe recognized him and greeted him warmly. In an instant, he was surrounded by eager elf tribe members, asking about the treasures he possessed. Chan Daolin realized that if the elves knew about his unique items, then the same must be the case for the tulip caravan. He had his storage bag on his waist, which he considered his trump card, and he was determined to use it to his advantage. As the tulip caravan's camp came into view, he slipped away from the crowd. However, he found himself in a predicament when faced with the pointed tips of spears as an unwelcome guest. He tried to explain that he knew the boss well, but it was only when Mr. Guyan arrived and asked the guards to stand down that the situation diffused. After exchanging pleasantries, Chen Daolin took out his fan to discuss his business with the caravan. He was confident that they would not miss the opportunity to make a profit. Mr. Guyan initially claimed he was running errands for the Duke's company and had no interest in wealth. However, Chen Daolin urged him not to be modest, as they were both traders who could understand each other's ambitions. When Mr. Guyan questioned whether Chen Daolin could impress him, Chen Daolin assured him that not only could he make money, but he also possessed something genuinely unique that Mr. Guyan had never seen before. At that instant, he proudly displayed a handful of glistening lollipops. However, Mr. Guyan failed to identify them and assumed they were precious stones. With a grin, Chen Daolin corrected him, stating that they were not gems, but candy. Naturally, Mr. Guyan had never encountered such a sight and pondered how candy could resemble a gem. To dispel the man's doubts, Chen Daolin tossed him one of the candies, urging him to taste it. Initially hesitant, Mr. Guyan questioned how the object in his hand could be candy when it looked as exquisite as the night sky. 
Yet his opinion shifted when he noticed its transparency and purity, becoming eager to sample it. Upon placing it in his mouth, he was met with a burst of flavor. In that moment, he felt like a superstar, savoring a taste he had never fathomed. Unconsciously drooling, he was entranced, tears welling in his eyes. Appearing lost in a trance, his guards exchanged concerned glances. It was then that Chen Daolin realized he had captivated Mr. Guyan. Without delay, he interrupted the man's thoughts, inquiring about his experience. Mr. Guyan, a savvy businessman, nonchalantly downplayed the candy's worth, asserting it couldn't be sold to the elves no matter how delightful it was. He then proposed a meager price, prompting Chen Daolin to suspect a scam. Refusing the offer of 20 copper plates for 50 grams of candy, Chen Daolin confidently demanded a gold coin for the same amount of candy. Chen Daolin was prepared to negotiate, highlighting that the man's understanding of the candy's value exceeded his own. Mr. Gian realized he had been discovered and attempted to deflect his guilt by accusing Chen Daolin of being unscrupulous. In response, Chen Daolin confessed to having a larger supply of candy, but assured Mr. Gian that he could continue to provide for his business needs. This gave Mr. Gian a competitive edge in the market, as Chen Daolin was his sole supplier. The guards of the caravan overheard this exchange and initially expressed doubt. However, after careful consideration, Mr. Guyan chuckled and sealed the deal with Chen Daolin, shaking hands in agreement. Following the successful negotiations, Mr. Guyan instructed his staff to prepare a lavish feast for their esteemed guest. Meanwhile, Chen Daolin maintained a sly smile behind his fan as he asked Mr. Guyan to wait momentarily. Chen Daolin confidently presented a stunning dagger to Mr. Guyan, eager to hear his opinion on its value. The spectators were taken aback by the beauty of the weapon, while Mr. Guyan seemed momentarily speechless. Chen Daolin, however, mistakenly assumed that everyone was impressed and proudly mentioned that he had more daggers in his possession. Mr. Guyan remained silent as Chen Daolin offered to negotiate a price. His hopes were quickly dashed when the crowd informed him about the renowned Tulip Family Workshop and their collaboration with top craftsmen worldwide, which increased the demand for their weapons. Undeterred, Chen Daolin insisted that his dagger was unique and urged Mr. Guyan to take a closer look. Initially unimpressed, Mr. Guyan soon realized the exceptional quality of the dagger upon closer inspection. Using his monocle, he examined the sharpness of the blade and noted the flawless steel grain, indicating superior quality steel. Overwhelmed, Mr. Guyan declared the dagger to be of premium quality, leaving the onlookers puzzled and Chen Daolin beaming with confidence. At that very moment, Mr. Guyan was struck by the realization that he had severely underestimated the young lad standing before him. How could someone who appeared so foolish possess the ability to produce such a valuable treasure effortlessly? This revelation sparked a curiosity within him, causing him to ponder over Chen Daolin's true identity and the hidden secrets that lay within those penetrating eyes. Upon closer inspection, Mr. Guyan noticed that despite the young man's foolish demeanor, there was an undeniable air of intelligence about him. This led to a surge of paranoia as he questioned whether Chen Daolin was secretly scheming against him. The seemingly childish and foolish act now appeared to be nothing more than a clever ruse. Beneath the facade of idiocy, Mr. Guyan saw the face of a cunning predator fixated on its unsuspecting prey. At that moment, Mr. Guyan believed he had utterly unraveled the young man's true nature, convinced that there were no more secrets left to be discovered. Fueled by this newfound confidence, he boldly inquired about the trading company Chen Daolin represented. However, Instead of providing a straightforward answer, Chen Daolin chose to cloak himself in an air of mystery, refusing to divulge such information. Nevertheless, he quickly clarified that he would still need to consult with his superiors regarding the price he could offer for the dagger. Seizing the opportunity, Mr. Gian turned the tables and challenged the young man to name his price, expressing his deep admiration for the blade. While Chen Daolin appeared momentarily dazed, Mr. Guyan, the unscrupulous businessman, couldn't help but smirk as he schemed to exploit the unsuspecting young man. Chen Daolin had finally come to a decision. With a dramatic gesture, he pointed upwards, building suspense before revealing his price. The amount he quoted was 100,000 gold coins. Mr. Guyan admired his boldness, while Chen Daolin found himself in an uncomfortable silence, with no one responding. At that moment, he questioned whether Ray had misled him about the blade's worth. After some time, Mr. Guyan agreed to the deal of 100,000 gold coins, surprising Chen Daolin. However, Mr. Guyan mentioned that the caravan did not have such a large sum of gold coins. Instead, he offered something of equal or greater value. Internally scolding Chen Daolin for his lack of knowledge, Mr. Guyan managed to confuse the young man with his words. He set a clever trap to uncover Chen Daolin's background. 
Ordering someone to bring a bag, Mr. Guyan presented it as a collection of treasures they had gathered along the journey, a bargaining chip. As the young man examined the contents, the merchant identified them as four top-quality gold-fired diamonds worth no less than 100,000 gold coins if sold in the market. While the boy marveled at the gems, Mr. Guyan proposed using them in exchange for the dagger. To his surprise, Chen Daolin declined the offer, leaving the businessman puzzled by the boy's illogical behavior. Chen Daolin casually returned the bag, explaining that he had no knowledge of gems and therefore saw no use for them. At that moment, Mr. Guyan pondered if the young man was ready to give up on the trade. However, the young man swiftly denied this and asserted that their integrity as traders remained intact, including his own. This prompted Mr. Guyan to propose an alternative solution by offering a contract. Nevertheless, Chen Daolin immediately dismissed the idea and chose to depart. The man with the dagger promised to return once Mr. Guyan had figured out how to complete the trade. With those words, he bid farewell to Mr. Guyan, leaving the latter wondering why he would easily entrust such a valuable item to him and wondering whether he did not fear it might be stolen. While the bystanders deemed Chen Daolin foolish, Mr. Guyan found him rather intriguing. On their way back, Chen Daolin unexpectedly sneezed, making him wonder if someone lurked in the depths of the elven forest. Lan Lan patiently waited for Chen Daolin's return her face lighting up with a bright smile as soon as she spotted him. While inquiring about his whereabouts throughout the day, the young man decided not to disclose it, fearing it might frighten her. However, he assured her that he was fine. He maintained an air of suspense, and Lan Lan eagerly urged him to sit down and share his story. After a while, Lan Lan's curiosity got the better of her, and she couldn't contain herself any longer. In response, Chen Daolin boasted about selling some items to the tulips and swindling them out of a significant amount of money. He considered it his revenge for the grudge they held since their first encounter. He firmly believed that he had avenged both himself and Lan Lan, as Mr. Guyan had threatened her. Suddenly, Lan Lan's voice turned cold, leaving the young man puzzled by the sudden change. Lan Lan then inquired if anything else had occurred. Chen Daolin's intuition kicked in, alerting him that something was off. He noticed that Lan Lan was hesitant to ask a simple question. When he inquired about her confusion, Chen Daolin mentioned the attractive young man from the Tulip family, which caught Lan Lan off guard. The look in her eyes revealed that she was indeed thinking about that guy, prompting Chen Daolin to confirm whether she had arrived with him in the elf settlement. As Lan Lan stared at him in surprise, he made another observation. He realized that when she stole a kiss from him, it was actually meant for that guy to witness. Tears welled up in Lan Lan's eyes, but she didn't deny Chen Daolin's observation. Instead, she admitted to being in the company of that Tulip family member. She confessed that she took advantage of Chen Daolin because she couldn't forget about her. At that moment, Chen Daolin realized how pitiful he was, as Lan Lan couldn't let go of her past. However, he sensed that something was amiss. Lan Lan referred to the handsome young man as though the latter were a girl. It was then that Chen Daolin realized that the person he had always thought was a young man was, in fact, a girl. This realization left him feeling disheartened. Despite this, he remained skeptical and needed to confirm his suspicions. He continued to seek clarification, specifically about the gender of the Tulip family member. Lan Lan, on the other hand, responded as if she had made everything clear from the start. At that moment, the young man couldn't help but feel a tinge of sadness, realizing that he had lost to a girl. Furthermore, Chen Daolin realized that he couldn't possibly compete with the girl. It was impossible for him to remove his pants and chop it off simply. Just as he was lost in his thoughts, Lan Lan interrupted him, appearing apologetic for causing him harm. Surprisingly, at that very moment, Chen Daolin decided to become a simp. He tenderly locked eyes with her teary gaze and expressed his apology before embracing her tightly. He felt remorseful because he had been unaware of the circumstances and should not have questioned Lan Lan in that manner. Chen Daolin consoled her, encouraging her to shed tears if she needed to release the grievances in her heart. Unexpectedly, Lan Lan retorted, asserting that she was not weak and there was no need for Chen Daolin to apologize. When the young man inquired if something was amiss, Lan Lan changed the subject and asked if he looked down upon her because she liked girls. She mentioned that society often frowned upon such matters. However, Chen Daolin dismissed these notions, declaring them to be nonsense and assuring her that there was nothing wrong. To prove his point, he struck a heroic pose, hoping to win her over and convince her that he did not judge her. Nevertheless, Lan Lan regarded him with disdain and labeled him as a pervert. Eventually, they settled down and built a campfire. As they did so, Chen Daolin requested Lan Lan to share their story. He rummaged through his belongings and handed her a chocolate bar, urging her to take it. Before beginning her story, Lan Lan examined the chocolate with doubt, comparing it to black mud. However, Chen Daolin reassured her, explaining its ability to relieve stress. 
Lan Lan popped it into her mouth and was pleasantly surprised by the delicious flavor, craving more. They settled down, and Lan Lan started recounting her upbringing in the temple, where she was chosen for her exceptional qualifications and became a disciple of one of the higher-ranking members. It was during this time that she encountered the girl from the Tulip family. Lan Lan first laid eyes on her in the autumn of a particular year when she accompanied her teacher to the Tulip family's castle for a meeting. Lan Lan waited outside and spotted the girl in the courtyard. Despite Lan Lan's nervousness, the girl took the initiative to approach her. It was then that Lan Lan discovered the girl was actually the heir of the renowned Tulip family, a name that the people in the temple had mentioned. A few days later, Lan Lan's teacher informed her that she would be training alongside talented individuals from the church with the cooperation of the Tulip family. The girl from the Tulip family also joined this secret training, and they spent three years together. During this time, Lan Lan received guidance and support in both cultivation and training from someone who had secretly helped her. This person had warned Lan Lan to keep their assistance a secret. It was at this moment that Lan Lan was deeply moved, as the girl had clandestinely taught her the forbidden techniques, which were the hidden secrets of the Tulip family. Lan Lan proceeded to recount the time they had spent together in detail. As their training days came to a close, Lan Lan was bestowed with the title of Saint, which came with the stipulation that she must not harbor any worldly love in her heart. Despite this restriction, Lan Lan hoped that the girl she cared for could help her navigate this challenging situation. In an attempt to seek solace, Lan Lan headed for the Tulip family's castle. However, she was met only by the family elder, who informed her that the girl had been punished because of their connection. The elder made it clear that there was no future between Lan Lan and the family's heir. Disheartened, Lan Lan left and began to embrace her new role with a heavy heart. Moved by Lan Lan's sorrowful tale, Chen Daolin tried to lift her spirits by pointing out the shooting stars in the night sky. He shared a tradition from his hometown where people made wishes on meteors, believing that their wishes would come true. Despite the meteor shower that night, Lan Lan refrained from making a wish, perhaps as a means of protecting herself from further disappointment. The following morning, Lan Lan awoke to find herself covered with a quilt, blushing slightly when she realized that Chen Daolin had tucked her in. She couldn't help but smile at his gesture, considering him a kind-hearted fool. Chen Daolin woke up and inquired about her whereabouts. He found Lan Lan who stood at a cliff overlooking the forest with a contemplative expression. Together, they admired the sunrise, and Lan Lan eventually revealed that she had visited the Tulip's caravan that morning, only to discover that the girl she admired had departed. Chen Daolin couldn't believe what he was hearing. The news took him by surprise, leaving him speechless. Before he could gather his thoughts, Lan Lan revealed that on the night the Beastmen had attacked them, it was the girl who had saved Lan Lan's life and brought her back to the elf settlement. Now that Chen Daolin had returned, the girl decided it was time for her to leave. Lan Lan mentioned how vital the girl's visit to the elf tribe was for the Tulip family. Lan Lan was grateful for the girl's companionship and the time they had spent together. However, her sudden decision to leave caught Chen Daolin off guard. He decided to give her some space and let her calm down. His mind shifted to the topic of money, and he remembered the saying that if relationships didn't prosper, business would. Outside the elf tribe settlement, there was a buzz of excitement as the elves flocked to buy goods from the Tulip family. Chen Daolin couldn't help but notice the commotion, and his curiosity was satisfied when he spotted Mr. Guyan and his crew. He couldn't help but feel a tinge of envy towards the popularity of the Tulips. However, he saw an opportunity to turn the tables and boast about receiving more attention than the Tulip family caravan. Without wasting any time, Chen Daolin set up his shop and displayed a variety of items such as handheld mirrors, perfumes, and combs. Just then, Mr. Guyan approached him, and Chen Daolin couldn't help but ask if he had come to see his goods. He hoped that Mr. Guyan wouldn't be petty about it. Ignoring his comments, Mr. Guyan inquired about the trade for the dagger. After a moment of contemplation, Chen Daolin decided to settle for the gold fire diamonds. Once the transaction was complete, Mr. Guyan wished him good luck with his business. Chen Daolin couldn't help but feel a sense of joy, knowing that his trip to the new world had been worthwhile, thanks to the diamonds. And once he finished selling his goods, he would return to his world to have some real fun. However, the thought of Lan Lan suddenly crossed his mind, causing Chen Daolin to pause for a moment. Despite this distraction, he decided to stay focused on selling his items. Hours passed, and exhaustion finally overcame him, causing him to collapse on the ground with a defeated expression. He couldn't help but wonder why he hadn't managed to make a single sale. To add insult to injury, Mr. Guyan took the opportunity to taunt him, pointing out his lack of success. Chen Daolin couldn't help but question whether the businessman had purposely come to provoke him. He believed that the success of the Tulip family caravan was solely due to the high demand for their popular shampoo, known as the Clear Frost Snow Liquid. However, 
Mr. Guyon attributed their success to the reputation the Tulip family had built over generations. In an attempt to help, Mr. Guyon suggested that Chen Daolin lower his prices slightly. However, Chen Daolin dismissed the idea, expressing his concern that he wouldn't be able to compete with the businessman. Their exchange left the onlookers speechless, creating an awkward atmosphere. Meanwhile, Mr. Guyon grew frustrated that dealing with the young man wasn't as easy as he had anticipated. Determined to get the upper hand, Mr. Guyon continued his attack, hoping to obtain Chen Daolin's items at a cheaper price. He then asked the young man if he knew why his goods weren't selling, despite their exquisite quality. Mr. Guyon explained that the shampoo sales were suffering due to competition from the tulip caravan. Intrigued, Chen Daolin asked Mr. Guyon for advice regarding the perfumes and mirrors, showing a glimmer of hope in his eyes. In response, the businessman made it clear that Chen Daolin had a limited understanding of elves. The elves, known as the children of nature, had a special connection with the grass tribes who possessed the ability to communicate with plants. Mr. Guyan casually mentioned that there were no natural scents that the elves desired, but couldn't obtain themselves. Chen Daolin was shocked by this revelation. However, Mr. Guyan didn't stop there. He went on to talk about the rarity of mirrors a hundred years ago, but how times had changed. In the modern era, the Roland Empire had become proficient in producing various glassware, including mirrors. Even the savage dwarves had an abundance of mirrors, not forgetting the Tulip family, who had been in the glassware business for ages. With each word, Chen Daolin's assumptions crumbled before him. He slumped, feeling a sense of awkwardness. Yet deep down, he couldn't help but grumble about the first Tulip Duke, who hadn't left any room for his successors as a senior transmigrator. Mr. Guyan then emphasized the elves' appreciation for art and their pursuit of beauty. The elves had a fondness for the vibrant fabrics and satins crafted by humans. They were also drawn to all sorts of musical instruments, which surprisingly didn't fetch a high price in the Roland Empire. However, even if it meant going bankrupt, it was worth it to ship these items to the elves. Chen Daolin diligently jotted down notes as Guyan elaborated. The elven market, that's what Mr. Guyan called it. He went on to explain that the Tulip family possessed expansive textile factories within the Roland Empire. Not only did they produce fabrics and silks that the elves adored, but they also manufactured durable linens that were highly sought after by dwarves and sailors. These were essential items, and textiles formed the backbone of the Tulip family's business empire. Chen Daolin couldn't hide his surprise. The first Tulip Duke had overseen the world's first industrial revolution, leaving him wondering if the latter had also dabbled with steam engines. This realization made him ponder what other avenues he could explore to make a living. He understood that this new world was fraught with danger, and he needed to find a way back home as soon as possible. As his thoughts wandered, they were abruptly interrupted by the businessman's explanation. It seemed that Chen Dalin's preference for gems and gold coins as the only form of currency posed a challenge when trading with the less affluent elves. The businessman emphasized that it was the unique specialties of the elves that he truly valued. To illustrate his point, he mentioned the significance of plant powders and their role in crafting magic potions and sacred spices. These items were highly sought after in the Roland Empire, making them rare and difficult to acquire. The businessman justified the risks involved in obtaining them due to their scarcity. Sensing a shift in the conversation, Chen Daolin decided to change the subject, feeling as though Mr. Gian was questioning his origins. In an attempt to salvage the situation, Chen Daolin suggested that perhaps Mr. Gian might be interested in something else he had to offer. Little did he know, Mr. Guyan silently celebrated his success in luring the young man into his trap, hook, line, and sinker. He caught a whiff of the perfume and explained that while the elves might not appreciate its strong fragrance, members of other races, especially those of higher status, would still accept it. Chen Daolin appeared to be in a desperate state and mustered the courage to ask for a price. Mr. Guyan couldn't hide his satisfaction, knowing that he had managed to discourage the young man. As a gesture of goodwill, Chen Daolin offered to give away all his mirrors, hoping to lighten his load. However, Mr. Guyan laughed dismissively, claiming that no one would want the mirrors, even if they were thrown away. Early the following day, Chen Daolin was awakened by one of Mr. Guyan's subordinates. As he opened his eyes, he saw that Lan Lan had slept beside him throughout the night. Confused and slightly annoyed, he asked her why she had been in his bed and urged her to get up quickly. It was then that Mr. Guyan arrived to inform them that their caravan's business had been concluded. He also revealed that his boss had instructed him to take care of Lan Lan. Curious, Mr. Guyan asked if there was anything else they needed. Lan Lan turned to Chen Daolin and inquired if he planned to stay with the elf tribe. Chen Daolin replied that it depended on Lan Lan, as he had finished his own business. Secretly, he was tired of constantly consuming vegetarian dishes. As he looked at Lan Lan, he couldn't help but wonder if he was missing something, even though nothing had happened between them. At that moment, memories of Barasa flooded his mind. 
Her bright eyes, beautiful face, and charming smile. He felt a pang of loss but quickly shook himself out of it, wondering why he was having such strange thoughts. Chen Daolin then asked Lan Lan about her plans. She expressed her desire to return to the Empire and suggested that they travel together as a group. Without hesitation, Chen Daolin agreed, and Lan Lan asked if he had anyone to bid farewell to. He denied having anyone and immediately began packing his belongings. Once they were ready to leave, Lan Lan asked Mr. Guyan to accompany them. It was at that moment that Chen Daolin realized he didn't know where Lan Lan was referring to when she mentioned returning. She clarified that she meant the Roland Empire. After shaking her head in disbelief at the strange question, Lan Lan's mind was brought back to reality by Mr. Guyan's reminder of the danger they faced if the temple found out about them. With unwavering determination in her voice, she confidently declared that there was nothing she wouldn't do. She knew that the vastness of the empire would make it impossible for them to be found. Lan Lan had spent three long years in the frozen forest, and she had grown tired of that place. She eagerly anticipated returning to the empire. The closeness between Lan Lan and the young man made him blush, unable to resist her request. As they held hands, Mr. Guyan could only let out a sigh, knowing the challenges that lay ahead. As they arrived back at the treehouse, Chen Daolin began packing his belongings, overwhelmed by the number of things he wanted to bring along. He urged Lan Lan to go and eat if she was hungry, but his distracted demeanor caught her attention. She couldn't help but wonder if something was bothering him. Gathering her courage, she decided to ask him directly if he was thinking about the elf girl. Chen Daolin's shock confirmed her suspicions, and she pressed on, revealing that she had witnessed his closeness with Barossa when they returned to the settlement. From her vantage point on top of the tree, she had seen it all. Chen Daolin found himself in a state of confusion, and his mind filled with frustration as he pondered why Lan Lan had waited so long to bring up the topic. Lan Lan assured him that he didn't need to hide anything, as he had always been good to her. She believed that he shouldn't be so hard on himself. As she turned away, she asked Chen Daolin to go and find the elf girl if he genuinely had strong feelings for her. The young man was taken aback, overwhelmed by a sudden urge to express his affection for Lan Lan. Following his instincts, he tried to explain that it was pointless to search for Barossa, as she was already disappointed in him. Memories of their shared moments flashed through his mind, from the joyful to the peaceful, all the way to the heartbreaking end. He then reminded Lan Lan of the promise he had made to accompany her back to the Roland Empire, wearing a bright smile on his face. He pleaded with her not to even consider getting rid of him. In response, Lan Lan turned away, calling him an idiot. She couldn't understand why he was being so kind to her knowing that she loved someone else and was attracted to women. To Lan Lan's surprise, Chen Daolin assured her that he wasn't foolish. He suddenly grabbed her and asked her to listen, leaving the girl flustered. Holding her tightly, he confessed that his feelings for her had left him in a state of confusion. If there were any other problems, he could solve them with money and power or any other means. However, as a man, he couldn't ignore his emotions. With that, he let go of her and awkwardly admitted that he couldn't simply cut it off. Lan Lan was taken aback by the comment, leaving her feeling perplexed. The atmosphere between her and Chen Daolin became awkward, and the latter couldn't help but wonder if he had said something inappropriate. After a brief moment of silence, Lan Lan suggested that she would wait for him outside. Meanwhile, Chen Daolin hurriedly finished packing his belongings. Lan Lan's heart was racing, and she couldn't shake off the confusion she felt. Chen Daolin, on the other hand, was flustered as well. He always saw himself as a witty and charming person, so he couldn't understand how he could have made such a mistake by telling an inappropriate joke to a girl. The two of them shared a moment of eye contact, both blushing once again. Eventually, Lan Lan burst into laughter, causing Chen Daolin to ask her why she found it amusing. Four days later, they left the Grass Elves territory under the escort of the Tulip Caravan and decided to set up camp near the Great Round Lake. Chen Daolin noticed an interaction between Mr. Gaian and his subordinates, who seemed to be seeking permission for something. Curious, Chen Daolin turned to Lan Lan and inquired about the situation. Lan Lan explained that the men from the caravan were planning to go hunting. Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder why it seemed like a more serious matter than he had anticipated. Lan Lan clarified that hunting within the frozen forest was dangerous, but as long as they worked together, everything would be fine. Lan Lan explained that the goods obtained through hunting were considered the property of the warriors, while the Tulip family showed no interest in them. She further elaborated that this was essentially a hidden form of support from the Tulip family. Chen Daolin appeared to grasp the concept and offered a thought-provoking analogy, likening the situation to the impossibility of raising fish in crystal clear water. Lan Lan was taken aback by Chen Daolin's insightful words and jokingly questioned when he had become a philosopher. Later that evening at the campsite, Chen Daolin cooked a portion of the demon wolf that had been hunted, finding it tender, beefy, and quite delectable. As he savored his meal, he overheard a raucous gathering nearby. 
Concerned about the noise, Chen Daolin inquired about the situation, to which Lan Lan explained that such revelry was permitted by the Tulip family and not worth his undue attention. Amidst the chaos, Chen Daolin observed a peculiar transaction taking place. A man approached a large rock and used it to extract the bone marrow from the hunted demon beast, revealing tiny glowing crystals within. Mr. Guyan, the man responsible for the extraction, appeared satisfied with his findings. When Chen Daolin sought clarification on the matter, Lan Lan revealed that Mr. Guyan was searching for magic cores within the bones of the demonic wolf, as the remains of the storm demon wolf were believed to hold valuable treasures. In addition, the creature's hide could serve as a protective cloak. The horns and enchanted cores were sought after by the magic union, and if they were in pristine condition, they could fetch a hefty sum of gold coins, sometimes even reaching the hundreds. When Chen Daolin expressed curiosity about the colossal beast being restrained by the men, Lan Lan enlightened him. Despite its meat being incredibly tough and unsuitable for consumption, and the magic core not holding much value, the Barrow Dragon possessed the ability to petrify its skin, rendering it impervious to harm and could swiftly maneuver, making it a formidable opponent in battle. However, the most prized possession of this creature was its glandular sac, which secreted a unique fluid. When this fluid was applied to one's skin, it would transform the flesh into a stone-like toughness within an hour. This liquid was highly sought after and in great demand within the Roland Empire. Chen Daolin couldn't resist teasing the young lady, asking about the fluid's specific use. Lan Lan was left flustered, unable to explain herself and blushing intensely from embarrassment. Eventually, she gave up trying and fell silent. Chen Daolin noticed Lan Lan's bright red face and remembered her mention of rubbing the fluid on the body. He immediately grasped its purpose, causing him to have a sudden nosebleed. He pondered whether he should try it too. Just then, Mr. Guyan interrupted, announcing a change of plans involving the camp. Realizing the Tulip family's strong bond, Chen Daolin decided to sneak away from camp due to his nearby portal. Faking a stomachache, he hastily grabbed his backpack and fled nervously into the frozen forest, using a compass to find his portal. Locating the portal where he had left it before, Chen Daolin urged himself to hurry. Opening the door, he reached out to the portal, finding comfort in the security it represented and the possibility of returning to a modern society. However, he hesitated, feeling there was something he couldn't leave behind. With a bountiful harvest in hand, he knew he could secure a prosperous future if he chose to exchange his treasures. However, thoughts of Lan Lan continued to occupy his mind, the memories of their shared moments flashing before him. Despite his efforts, he couldn't shake himself free from these thoughts. Chen Daolin scolded himself for indulging in such distractions, banging his head against the nearby tree in an attempt to snap out of it. He reminded himself that in his world, there would be plenty of girls and wealth awaiting him. His face bore a slight bruise, and he was breathless, desperately urging himself to wake up. But then, he realized that he couldn't just leave. The door was right there, within reach, yet he hesitated to step through it. The mere thought of abandoning Lan Lan was unbearable. After all, he was no longer alone. With a throbbing bump on his head, he berated himself for being sentimental as he leaned against the portal door. He convinced himself to stay by Lan Lan's side, knowing that he could slip away at any moment. Once he had calmed down, he became aware of the pain throbbing in his head. Reluctantly, he started to walk away, but at that moment, he couldn't help but sob at the idea of leaving his portal behind. The door trembled and creaked before finally collapsing onto the ground, as if responding to Chen Daolin's desires. After a brief pause, he cautiously peered through the door once more and found the familiar sight of the warehouse in his hometown. He was surprised to see that the transdimensional door had become portable, and he was intrigued by this unexpected twist. A smile of excitement spread across his face as he realized that the magic storage bag given to him by Ray, the werewolf, had finally come in handy. With some effort, he managed to fit the entire door into the bag. However, he couldn't help but worry about the bag's size, Miraculously, it rapidly shrank back down to its original size, alleviating his concerns. Chen Daolin's excitement was palpable as he enthusiastically spoke to the motionless bag, pledging to be steadfast companions and rely on each other in the days to come. Above all, he was overjoyed at the prospect of being able to return home whenever he pleased. The day's bountiful harvest brought him immense satisfaction. With a cheerful demeanor, Chen Daolin strolled along the shores of the magnificent lake, utilizing his compass to navigate his way back to camp. His anticipation to reunite with Lan Lan fueled his happiness. The compass proved to be his trusted ally, ensuring that even in the darkest of nights he would not lose his way. However, his celebration seemed premature, as he unexpectedly found himself in another clearing, realizing that he was truly lost. Anxiety washed over him, knowing that the vicinity of the lake was teeming with wild beasts, leaving him pondering his next move. 
As he gazed at his reflection on the water's surface, a realization dawned upon him. By following the banks of the Great Round Lake, he could eventually locate the campsite. At that moment, he considered himself a genius and resolved to continue his journey. Along the way, he contemplated what explanation to offer if questioned about his disappearance. The most straightforward response he could think of was that he had gone to relieve himself. However, he couldn't help but wonder if that would subject him to ridicule. After some time, he realized that he had been walking in the wrong direction. Although he would eventually stumble upon the camp, it was still a considerable distance away. After some time, he stumbled upon a campfire and questioned whether he had reached the camp so quickly. As he approached, he noticed a peculiar figure standing next to the fire, which gave the clearing an eerie atmosphere. Lost in his thoughts, he failed to realize that the figure, who turned out to be Luok Shui, had spotted him and was now looking in his direction. Chen Daolin understood that it was too late for him to escape. However, in the next instant, he immediately recognized the elf and exclaimed with surprise. Luok Shui also recognized him as the amusing human from before. Once Chen Daolin settled by the fire, Luok Shui mentioned that it must be fate that they had crossed paths once again. At that moment, the young man realized that the elf's smile had a disarming effect on people. This quality both fascinated and terrified him. He couldn't help but wonder why Luok Shui always seemed to encounter people by the lake in the dead of night, and if he was waiting for someone. Suddenly, Luok Shui spoke up, sensing the presence of another individual and urging them to reveal themselves. Chen Daolin was taken aback because he couldn't sense anyone's presence. Once again, the girl from the Tulip family appeared, accompanied by an elder wearing a menacing mask. Moreover, the elder seemed to hold Luok Shui in contempt. Caught in the middle of these two parties, Chen Daolin found himself in an uncomfortable situation. Luok Shui appeared frozen in place, leaving Chen Daolin concerned and questioning why the elf remained motionless. Suddenly, he felt a strange force approaching him and Luok Shui. A powerful energy seemed to emanate from the elf's body, causing Chen Daolin to inwardly complain, unwilling to be dragged into the elf's conflicts. Emerging from behind a nearby tree, the mysterious elder donned his mask and swiftly moved, leaving behind a trail of afterimages. In an instant, he stood face to face with Luok Shua, creating a tense standoff. Chen Daolin, feeling a surge of fear, pleaded with the two bosses to let him go, explaining his urgent need to leave. However, Chen Daolin soon realized something was terribly wrong as his body became paralyzed, overwhelmed by an intense surge of energy that made him cough up blood. Just as panic set in, a gentle hand rested on his shoulder. It was Luok Shui, shielding him with his aura and warning him not to meet the masked man's gaze, for he possessed no magical abilities. As Luok Shui spoke, the masked stranger settled near the crackling campfire, expressing his apologies for the delay. To Chen Daolin's surprise, the elf was surprisingly laid back, dismissing any concerns about the wait. After all, he claimed to be a carefree individual who lived by the lake. At that moment, the member of the Tulip family noticed Chen Daolin's presence and stared at him, causing him to scowl in confusion. Luo Shui, intrigued, questioned why the girl had brought the masked elder along, considering the deep-rooted animosity between her ancestors and the mysterious man. The masked man retorted, acknowledging past disagreements but asserting that they still belong to the same family. Chen Daolin found his voice to be sharp and piercing, reminiscent of clashing metal or the grating sound of rusted iron. Luok Shui referred to the promise made between himself, the Tulip family's ancestors, and their heirs, questioning the sudden change in witnesses as the previous one had not appeared. The young woman appeared sad as she recounted the passing of Master Lanhai, the renowned witness who had left this world a decade ago without passing on his wisdom. Chen Daolin was struck by the girl's cleverness marveling at how effortlessly she could manipulate her emotions to gain sympathy from others. Luo Shui let out a deep sigh as he reminisced about his friendship with the late Mr. Lan Hai, expressing regret over the loss of an old companion. As the two old friends exchanged words, Luo Shui brought up his past connections with the girl's grandfather and father. Unexpectedly, the girl interjected, asserting her equality with any man in the world despite her gender. She even attempted to provoke Luo Shui, insinuating that he held sexist beliefs. Unfazed, Luok Shui smiled and compared the girl's tenacity to that of her ancestors. Curious, Luok Shui inquired about the girl's name. She introduced herself as Misia Rudolph, a name reminiscent of a legendary heroine from the ancient history of the Roland Empire. Luok Shui acknowledged the name with a smile and then asked for her given name. Miss Rudolph commended him for his perceptiveness, but hesitated to reveal her private name, casting a suspicious glance at Chen Daolin. After a moment of contemplation, Miss Rudolph sighed and decided that it was best to keep her private name a secret. She picked up a stick and wrote on the ground, catching Chen Daolin's attention. Curious, he peered at the name she had written, Du Weiwei, and subconsciously read it aloud. 
At that moment, the three individuals standing before him were left in a state of shock. However, it was the masked older man who was the first to react. His body emitted a powerful aura as he reached out his hand, channeling his magical energy to create a massive hand that seized Chen Daolin by the neck. The force of the impact caused the young man to cough up blood, while the masked old man demanded to know his identity. As he pinned Chen Daolin against a nearby tree with his formidable power, the old man insisted on learning how the young man was able to comprehend the lost language of the Snowy Mountain sect. He then turned his attention to the elf, inquiring about the young man's origins. Despite Luo Xue's attempts to intervene, Chen Daolin winced in pain and struggled to call for help. Luo Xue's efforts to mediate only provoked a violent reaction from the masked man, leading to a clash of powers between the two. The resulting shockwave sent Chen Daolin flying backward as the confrontation escalated, culminating in a blinding flash of light. After the dust settled, Chen Daolin complained of a burning sensation in his chest, abdomen, and throat, making it difficult for him to breathe. When the elf inquired about his well-being, Chen Daolin suddenly coughed up more blood, revealing a ruby-like object in his hand. This unexpected occurrence left the young man questioning if the red object in his hand was an ice cube. As the elf offered Chen Daolin Garuda flower juice for his recovery, he reprimanded the masked man, Mr. Duan, for his rash actions and use of frost battle energy on a mere child. Miss Rudolph, also known as Du Weiwei, extended her assistance in treating Chen Daolin's wound. As she used her magical abilities to heal him, she expressed her apologies for her elder's impulsive behavior. Curious by nature, she took advantage of the moment to inquire about the young man's identity and his ability to decipher the Tulip family's writings. With a determined gaze, she sought to uncover the truth and find the answers she sought. However, her intentions were interrupted by the old man, who suggested that he should take charge of the interrogation. Mr. Duan approached the young man, his demeanor becoming threatening. At that moment, Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder what the old man had in store for him. He pondered his next move, and contemplated the possibility of his life ending in that very place. Unbeknownst to Chen Daolin, the elf named Luok Shue closely monitored the situation and resolved to protect the young man's life. Mr. Duan clenched his fist, demanding to know the boy's identity, and suddenly swung his fist, aiming to strike him. Just as the attack was about to connect, a shout echoed through the clearing, and Lan Lan appeared. Swiftly firing an arrow towards Mr. Duan, Lan Lan made her presence known. On the other side of the clearing, Barossa suddenly emerged, rushing towards the same target with a dagger in hand, her intentions deadly. As both attacks closed in on the old man, he unleashed his frost battle energy once more, repelling the assaults. The impact of his counterattack forced Barossa back, causing her slight injury. Concerned, Chen Daolin called out to her, but his words were interrupted by Lan Lan, who inquired about his well-being. Despite his pain, Chen Daolin requested Lan Lan's assistance in helping Barossa. However, Lan Lan dismissed his concerns and instead aided him, urging him to focus on himself. With a cold tone, Luok Shui expressed her gratitude to Mr. Duan for sparing Barossa. In response, the old man assured her that he would never be excessively harsh, as they were within elven territory. At that moment, Barossa managed to regain her footing, struggling to stand and calling out to Chen Daolin with a worried expression. Chen Daolin couldn't help but ask Barossa what she was doing in that place. His question struck a nerve, causing her to well up with tears as she accused him of being heartless. Barossa lamented that he had left without even saying goodbye, making her question if he ever thought of her at all. Chen Daolin was left speechless, unable to find the right words to respond. As Barossa looked at him with a wounded expression, she wondered if she meant nothing more to him than a stranger. Chen Daolin remained silent, fully aware that his actions were deliberate because he wanted to erase her from his memory. However, Barossa persisted, demanding answers. In response, Chen Daolin mustered the courage to apologize for hurting her. Just then, Lan Lan interjected, calling Chen Daolin an idiot for not realizing that Barossa's unwavering presence meant that she cherished him deeply. Barossa, clearly displeased by Lan Lan's harsh words, voiced her complaints. But before she could say anything else, Chen Daolin questioned whether she had truly abandoned her tribe to follow him. Barossa blushed in response, choosing to remain silent. This left Chen Daolin slightly bewildered. However, their moment was abruptly interrupted when the old man dismissed their matters and insisted on repeating the earlier question to Chen Daolin. To make matters worse, Mr. Duan threatened to harm him if he didn't answer truthfully. Miss Rudolph stepped in, explaining to the old man that Chen Daolin was her old friend. Yet the old man remained unconvinced, wondering if Miss Rudolph was curious about how Chen Daolin knew their secret language. In response, Miss Rudolph admitted her curiosity but requested that the matter be left to her. Mr. Duan then turned to Luok Shuo, seeking his opinion. However, his response was firm. He would not stand idly by and watch the girl from his elf tribe being bullied right before his eyes. 
Moreover, with the head of the Tulip family present, there was no need for Mr. Duan to be so anxious. Eventually, the masked old man calmed down and permitted them to do as they pleased. Lan Lan positioned herself between Miss Rudolph and Chen Daolin, instinctively raising her hand to shield him. In response, Miss Rudolph reassured Lan Lan that she had no intention of causing harm to the young man as she approached and walked past Lan Lan. Unable to utter another word, Lan Lan watched as Miss Rudolph engaged in a conversation with Chen Daolin, reminiscing about their past encounters and the incident involving the beast man's injury. Chen Daolin insisted on getting straight to the point, urging them to explain how he could understand their language. Miss Rudolph agreed, emphasizing the importance of the matter as it involved a significant secret of the Tulip family. She explained that only the descendants of the Tulip family knew the language. Furthermore, apart from Miss Rudolph and her ancestors, the only other individuals who had learned the language were Luokshua, who used it as a secret means of communication with the Tulip family. Miss Rudolph's family hailed from the Snowy Mountain, the very place where the language had been preserved. However, Chen Daolin was neither an elf nor a resident of the Snowy Mountains, nor did he have any connection to the Tulip family. Miss Rudolph was curious about how Chen Daolin had come to know the secret language. The anticipation in the atmosphere was palpable as everyone eagerly awaited his explanation. Chen Daolin, on the other hand, found the situation quite absurd. Beads of sweat trickled down his face as he pondered how to answer such a question. With images from his world flashing through his mind, after a moment, he took a deep breath and reached into his storage bag, pulling out a dictionary. It was a Chinese dictionary. Miss Rudolph caught the heavy book. Her curiosity peaked. As Chen Daolin began to explain, he dismissed the Tulip family's language as anything but secret. In his world, everyone knew that language. While Miss Rudolph examined the dictionary, Chen Daolin realized that he couldn't reveal anything more than that. The people of this world were powerful and could potentially destroy his world. He racked his brain for a suitable explanation feeling trapped in this strange predicament of arriving in a new world only to find someone had preceded him by centuries. As expected, Miss Rudolph pressed for further clarification. Chen Daolin hesitated, fearing that his answer would sound too absurd to be believed. However, when she insisted, he turned to the other girls present, Lan Lan and Barossa. He reminded them that they had asked about his origins and apologized for not telling them the truth earlier. He admitted that he wasn't from the Roland Empire, Lan Lan found it odd that Chen Daolin knew nothing about the Empire, but when he mentioned being from the South Sea, she didn't think much of it. However, he didn't resemble the natives of the South Sea at all. Chen Daolin humbly apologized for his earlier deception before revealing the truth about his origins, which lay thousands of miles away from the Roland Empire. He hesitated to disclose further details, fearing that his companions would not believe him. Luak Shui inquired if he hailed from the North, given the vast distance he mentioned. After a concise explanation, Chen Daolin disclosed that he came from a distant land across the sea, where a different race thrived and established its nation. That was his homeland. He explained that in his homeland, the language spoken was known as Chinese, and it was the common tongue among its inhabitants. Miss Rudolph then shared that the first duke had left behind notes revealing the actual name of their secret language, also known as Chinese. Chen Daolin elaborated that when asked how he knew the language, he found it perplexing that they could speak his native tongue. He clarified that he was familiar with the language because everyone spoke it in his homeland. Miss Rudolph pointed out the irony, questioning how her ancestor could have known the language. Chen Daolin confirmed her observation. Mr. Duan then inquired how Chen Daolin had ended up in the frozen forest of the Roland mainland, given the considerable distance from his homeland. At that moment, Chen Daolin felt compelled to share a grand tale of his journey, imagining his arrival on a rocket. However, he swiftly dismissed the idea and clarified that he had arrived on the continent after enduring a shipwreck at sea for a considerable amount of time. Upon hearing this, Luo Shui deduced that the ancestor of the Tulip family appeared to be someone from Chen Daolin's country. Nevertheless, Miss Rudolph countered this claim and insisted that her ancestor hailed from a noble family in the Roland Empire. She was firmly convinced that he was a native. In light of this, Luo Shui resorted to another conclusion— suggesting that the Tulip family's ancestor had ventured to that foreign country. Mr. Duan interjected, stating that it was not necessarily the case since the language had been passed down in the Snowy Mountains. He wondered if his ancestors also came from overseas. Luok Shui acknowledged the possibility, prompting Miss Rudolph to declare that it didn't matter either way. She chose to believe Chen Daolin's words and promised not to cause him any further trouble. Turning to Luok Shui, Miss Rudolph asked if he was ready. Once Luok Shui confirmed their readiness, both of their bodies ascended, soaring into the air, much to Chen Daolin's surprise. Their levitating figures eventually came to a halt hundreds of meters above the magnificent round lake. Perplexed, 
Chen Dalin sought an explanation for this extraordinary occurrence. The old man referred to a war that took place centuries ago, during a time when Luo Shui reigned as the King of the Elves and commanded numerous forces in his allied army. It was during this war that the first Tulip Duke served as Roland's commander. Despite being on opposing sides, they eventually realized the futility of their conflict and reached a tacit agreement to end the war. As part of this agreement, the Roland Empire relinquished the barren land in the north to the Elves, who in turn received the Frozen Forest. The Beastmen, on the other hand, planned to establish their kingdom. Despite the resolution of the conflict, deep-seated animosity persisted between humans and all other races. A clandestine agreement was forged between the Tulip family and Luakshwe, stipulating that each successive generation of the Tulip family's heirs must journey to the north to be evaluated by Luakshwe. This evaluation would determine if they possessed the intelligence and wisdom necessary to uphold the fragile peace. Upon receiving Luakshwe's approval, the current state of affairs would be maintained. However, if Luakshwe deemed the human leader unworthy, the northern races would launch an invasion of the south. At that moment, Chen Daolin had a revelation. He understood why Miss Rudolph exhibited such a strong sense of duty as he observed the two figures in the sky locked in a silent exchange. After an hour, there was movement as the two individuals pressed their palms against each other. A dazzling light illuminated the sky, symbolizing the renewal of a contract. Chen Daolin found this display to be overly dramatic. Eventually, the two descended from the sky, and Miss Rudolph's trembling body gently landed on the surface of the lake. It was evident that she was struggling to catch her breath, and upon closer examination, Chen Daolin noticed signs of internal injuries. Lan Lan's expression of deep concern did not go unnoticed by Chen Daolin. He encouraged her to assist Miss Rudolph, emphasizing the importance of Lan Lan's presence at that moment. Tears filled Lan Lan's eyes as she swiftly went to aid Miss Rudolph. At that moment, Chen Daolin felt a sense of inner turmoil. He questioned his actions and motivations. Observing the two girls, Chen Daolin realized that he had been foolish. Barossa, in a sudden display of reverence, addressed Luoxue by his ancient title of the Great Son of the North before humbly kneeling before him. Luoxue, however, requested that Barossa refrain from using such honorifics, as it had been quite some time since he held the title of Elf King. Despite Luoxue's insistence, Barossa continued to express her belief that he was still revered as a god among the elves. The former Elf King found this notion ironic and encouraged Barossa to rise to her feet. Their interaction was interrupted by Mr. Duan, who attempted to instigate a confrontation with the old Elf King. When Luoxue questioned Mr. Duan's intentions, the latter admitted to harboring a desire to engage in combat with the elf. In a display of power, Luoxue pointed out that their strengths were evenly matched, and there was no need for conflict unless there was an ulterior motive at play. Mr. Duan agreed, prompting Luoxue to comply with his request. As tensions rose, Miss Rudolph sensed danger and swiftly erected a magical barrier to protect those around her. Mr. Duan, undeterred, launched an attack against Luoxue, who retaliated with a surge of immense magical power. The resulting clash culminated in a massive explosion, sending shockwaves of energy rippling through the area. Luoxue, reflecting on past conflicts, considered his previous defeat at the hands of Mr. Duan to be a great shame in his life. However, the encounter proved to be a turning point for him, as he gained a newfound respect for the inhabitants of that realm. The elderly men engaged in a heated battle, their powers colliding with intense force. The overwhelming fiery energy took Chen Daolin by surprise. In the blink of an eye, the conflict appeared to reach its conclusion, with Luo Shu conceding that he was unable to evade or counter Mr. Duan's assault. As Mr. Duan's mask fell away, a faint smile graced his lips, acknowledging the former Elf King's earnest efforts. Chen Daolin observed as the fragments of the mask fell to the ground and disintegrated, revealing the exposed face of Mr. Duan, who appeared frail in Chen Daolin's eyes. Mr. Duan turned to Miss Rudolph and inquired about her takeaways from the intense battle they had just witnessed. Miss Rudolph responded by stating that she had gained a new perspective on the word true after witnessing the skill and determination of the two fighters. Following the duel, Mr. Duan expressed his satisfaction with the outcome and indicated his readiness to depart. Luo Shui, on the other hand, expressed his gratitude for the rivalry they had shared and stated that he would never forget their battles. Mr. Duan chuckled and bid farewell as he soared into the sky. As Luok Shui watched Mr. Duan's departure, he reflected on the impending loss of his old friend. He then turned to Miss Rudolph and assured her that the alliance between the Tulip family and the elves could continue as she had earned his approval. He reminded Miss Rudolph once again that this was her only chance to enter the frozen forest, warning her that if she dared to do so again, she would become his sworn enemy. Furthermore, 
He had made a solemn vow long ago that he would never leave the frozen forest as long as a single descendant of the Tulip family remained alive. With those words hanging in the air, he gracefully soared into the night sky, disappearing. Lan Lan let out a heavy sigh, realizing that the ordeal was truly over. Suddenly, Miss Rudolph's complexion turned pale, and she coughed up blood, leaving Lan Lan deeply concerned. She couldn't help but wonder what was wrong with her. Despite her condition, Miss Rudolph insisted that she was fine, and explained that she had used up the last of her strength to respond to the former Elf King. The magical contract between them had drained her energy significantly, and she desperately needed to rest. As she spoke, she handed Lan Lan a small glowing pill, explaining that it held an extraordinary power. Curious, Chen Daolin examined the pill, only for it to suddenly activate and emit a signal into the sky. It dawned on him that it was a signal flare, a call for help. Watching it burst into a beautiful display of light, he felt a wave of relief wash over him. Finally, they were safe. Barossa gazed in awe at the magnificent fireworks display, his eyes shining with excitement. Suddenly, there was a brief silence, followed by the arrival of Mr. Guyan and his men. Chen Dalin's face lit up with happiness upon seeing them, but he couldn't help but notice the determined look on their faces as they rushed toward him. Something was definitely wrong. Mr. Guyan's attention was drawn to Miss Rudolph, who appeared to be injured, and he wondered who was responsible for it. Chen Daolin and Barossa, who were standing nearby. In a fit of rage, Mr. Guyan led his men to protect their boss, pointing their weapons at the duo with the intention of apprehending them. Chen Daolin felt a wave of nervousness wash over him as he tried to explain that it was all a misunderstanding. Huddled together, he and Barossa faced the horde of mercenaries. The mercenaries were furious that their young master had been hurt and they were willing to die for her. However, Lan Lan's voice cut through the tension. She informed Mr. Guyan that Miss Rudolph had used too much magic and had fainted, assuring him that it had nothing to do with Chen Daolin and Barossa. Guyan called her to the side, and she explained the situation to him. After giving the duo one last skeptical look, Mr. Guyan approached them. He turned to his team and ordered them to prepare for departure, stating that they would escort the young master back. He also urged Lan Lan to trust them with the rest and instructed his men to handle Miss Rudolph with care. Lan Lan hesitated for a moment, casting one final glance at Chen Daolin, who met her gaze but remained silent. Lan Lan turned away with a sad look on her face, and that's when Barossa's hand made contact with Chen Daolin's clenched fist. Chen Daolin couldn't help but wonder if Barossa was trying to offer some comfort, but his surprise grew when Barossa leaned on his shoulder, causing a moment of panic before he scrambled to find the right words to break the awkwardness. Chen Daolin gathered his thoughts and inquired if Barossa had indeed followed him all the way from her home. Barossa confessed to following him for several days. She pointed out that Chen Daolin only seemed to talk to Lan Lan and didn't pay attention to anything else. Chen Daolin started to stammer, but Barossa urged him not to feel the need to explain as emotions couldn't be forced. She reassured Chen Daolin that he didn't need to feel guilty and that she wanted to be by his side and see him. Once she saw him off, she would return home and put him out of her mind completely. She emphasized the difference in their races, stating that he didn't owe her anything as a human to an elf. With a melancholic expression, Barossa continued, recounting how her brother once told her that when it came to true love, nothing was rational. She acknowledged that what she was doing wasn't right, but she couldn't forget the night before they left for the elf tribe when she asked if he liked her. As Barossa questioned whether Chen Daolin liked her, tears welled up in her eyes. She couldn't help but feel guilty for asking such a vulnerable question. However, at that moment, it didn't matter to her whether he reciprocated her feelings or not. With tearful eyes, she bravely confessed her affection for Chen Daolin, simply wanting to express her genuine emotions. Suddenly, Chen Daolin's hand reached out and pulled her into a warm embrace, catching Barossa off guard. While she was slightly puzzled, Chen Daolin apologized for his previous foolishness and for only focusing on Lan Lan, who clearly had feelings for someone else. And yet, all this time, there was a wonderful girl in his arms who showered him with affection, and he had chosen to abandon her for Lan Lan. He acknowledged that he had been a complete idiot, these were Chen Daolin's thoughts as he held Barossa close. In the next moment, Barossa gently pulled away from the hug and with a concerned expression, asked Chen Daolin to return to the camp. Chen Daolin, furious and unwilling to leave Barossa's side, boldly suggested that they should forge their path and leave the forest. After all, the world was vast and there was nowhere they couldn't go. As Barossa stumbled over her words, Chen Daolin wondered if she no longer wanted to accompany him. Despite her flustered state, Barossa explained that she had left her home without informing anyone, and she felt guilty for causing her brother to worry. Chen Daolin interrupted her, expressing his reluctance to let her go, surprising Barossa even more because they belonged to different races. Chen Daolin's eyes sparkled with excitement as he pleaded with her to leave the enchanted forest and embark on a new adventure with him. 
The idea of a forbidden love between a human and an elf intrigued Barossa, and she suggested they explore the Roland Empire first to see what wonders awaited them. Chen Daolin eagerly agreed, promising that they would make the journey together. But then, Barossa posed a question that caught him off guard. What would they do after they visit the Empire? Chen Daolin felt a wave of uncertainty wash over him. He hadn't considered the future beyond his initial plan of using the trans-dimensional door for personal gain. As he nervously glanced at the girl standing before him, he realized it was time to make a decision. Should he bring Barossa along to his world, or leave her behind? Lost in his thoughts, Chen Daolin was startled when Barossa interrupted his internal debate and agreed to his suggestion. With a reassuring smile, she withdrew her question and expressed her desire to bid him farewell and forget about him. Chen Daolin was momentarily taken aback, but then newfound confidence washed over him. He declined her offer with a determined smile. He declared that he couldn't bear to let her go back alone, for it would diminish his sense of manhood. With sincerity in his eyes, Chen Daolin explained that his hesitation stemmed from concerns about the complications that might arise if he brought Barossa into his world. He worried about the challenges they might face, knowing she wasn't from the Roland Empire like he was. Taking her home could potentially lead to some issues which made him uneasy. However, Chen Daolin made a promise to Barossa to carefully consider the situation and take his time, as he was confident that a solution could be found. Barossa was moved to tears of joy as Chen Daolin expressed his willingness to give their relationship a chance. As they prepared to leave, they were stopped by mercenaries from the Tulip family, who quickly surrounded them. The mercenaries demanded to know why Chen Daolin had not returned to their camp yet. Chen Daolin firmly stated that his whereabouts were not their concern, as he was not a member of the Tulip family and did not require their permission to leave. Despite their attempts to intimidate him, Chen Daolin stood his ground. One of the mercenaries insisted that Chen Daolin explain their young master's injury before leaving. The mercenary leader drew his sword, which emitted a strange aura, and urged Chen Daolin to return to the camp for an explanation. Faced with the threat of the mercenaries, Chen Daolin reluctantly agreed to accompany them back to their camp, fearing for Barossa's safety. The mercenary leader, showing a lack of interest in getting involved himself, ordered his crew to escort their guests back to the camp. However, in a sudden turn of events, the mercenary leader's demeanor changed as he set his sights on Barossa with a lascivious smile. Fortunately, Barossa's quick wit came to the rescue as she reminded the mercenary group of their location within the elven realm. She questioned whether their actions reflected the values of the Tulip family. In response, the commander defended himself, stating that his master was in a coma for no apparent reason and that they were ordered to bring both Barossa and Chen Daolin back to the camp for clarification. Barossa insisted that she would accompany Chen Daolin and urged the commander to consider their friendship between the two sides. Later that night, Chen Daolin returned to the Tulip Caravan's camp and was warmly greeted by Mr. Guyan. Chen Daolin, however, was not interested in pleasantries and wanted to get straight to the point. He acknowledged the power of the Tulip family and requested that Mr. Guyan ask his questions directly, as he already knew everything. With a slight smile, Mr. Guyan inquired about the meaning behind Chen Daolin's words and whether he had been mistreated during the journey. Chen Daolin countered, arguing that there was no need for Mr. Guyan to use such pleasant words, as it was due to the injuries of the Tulip family's young master that he was brought back to the camp for interrogation. Therefore, Mr. Guyan didn't need to display such hypocrisy. He expressed his concern that if he hadn't been kind, he might have met a grim fate at the hands of Mr. Guyan's subordinates. Consequently, there was no common ground for them to discuss. As Chen Daolin spoke, Mr. Guyan observed the commander with curiosity, demanding an explanation for the situation. Nervously, the commander, Charlotte, explained that he had requested Chen Daolin to return to the camp and speculated that he must have been feeling guilty about something. Chen Daolin's face darkened, and with an angry voice, he questioned whether the Tulip family made requests using swords. At that moment, Mr. Guyan scolded Charlotte for his rudeness towards their guests, not allowing him to defend himself. He even went as far as slapping him, instructing him to be quiet and leave his sight. Mr. Guyan clarified that he had only asked the commander to fetch the guests, not to act on their own accord. Chen Daolin silently observed the scene unfold while the commander looked miserable, Mr. Guyan adjusted his monocle and apologized for the entire incident. In response, Chen Daolin waved it off and requested the astute businessman to ask any questions he had. For a significant portion of the evening, Chen Daolin sat beside Mr. Guyan and Barossa, recounting the events that led to Miss Rudolph's injury. He mentioned that it would have sufficed if Mr. Guyan had asked Lan Lan the same questions. In response, Mr. Guyan informed Chen Daolin that Lan Lan had been diligently caring for the young master in the tent since their return to the camp. As Chen Daolin gazed into the fire, he absorbed this new information. The following morning, Chen Daolin rested beside Barossa and observed the Tulip family guards keeping a close watch on him. 
Realizing that he could not blindly trust Mr. Guyan's words, Chen Daolin understood that any attempt to leave would likely result in immediate hostility. After a sleepless night, during which Chen Daolin neither ate nor drank, his anger remained unabated. Adding to his frustration was Lan Lan's absence, despite his waiting from midnight until dawn. He pondered whether Lan Lan held him in such low regard that he did not even compare to a strand of Miss Rudolph's hair. His thoughts were interrupted by a sudden shout echoing through the camp, announcing the young master's awakening. Lan Lan's voice reassured the guards and called for Mr. Guyan and the doctors to attend to the young master. As Lan Lan briefly made eye contact with Chen Daolin before returning to the tent, Barossa observed Chen Daolin with concern. Chen Daolin assured Barossa that he was fine, expressing relief at finally gaining clarity and awakening to the situation at hand. His primary concern was the injustice he and Barossa had suffered. As the day slowly turned into evening and the sun began its descent, Lan Lan finally stepped out of the tent. She was immediately met with Chen Daolin's intense gaze. Keeping a small distance between them, she explained that she had only asked for him to be brought to the camp on the previous night out of concern for his well-being. However, she hadn't anticipated the guards mishandling the situation. Chen Daolin responded with a curt acknowledgement, creating an awkward atmosphere that Barossa couldn't ignore. Lan Lan continued to apologize sincerely, expressing her shock and regret at how poorly Chen Daolin had been treated, having been made to wait outside all day and night. Chen Daolin's expression remained stern, mirroring Barossa's as he argued that Mr. Guyan, a member of the Tulip family, had already apologized. He then rhetorically asked if Lan Lan was also from the Tulip family, implying that she did not need to apologize. Tears welled up in Lan Lan's eyes at that moment. She tried to explain that she understood Chen Daolin's anger for not coming out to see him the previous night, citing Miss Rudolph's coma as a reason. However, before she could say anything else, Chen Daolin interrupted her, stating that he didn't care. Furthermore, Everyone didn't need to treat Miss Rudolph with such delicacy. Lan Lan attempted to clarify why she couldn't come out at night before humbly asking Chen Daolin not to be upset with her. However, the young man couldn't help but find it peculiar that the stubborn girl before him was willing to lower her head and speak so kindly. It seemed highly unlikely. At that very moment, Chen Daolin had firmly decided to stop simping over this girl. With a serious expression, he mentioned the happiness he felt when Lan Lan bravely emerged from the darkness to save him. However, when Miss Rudolph fainted, Lan Lan immediately panicked, and when she left, she did so without uttering a single word to him. Chen Daolin explained that it was then he realized something. Lan Lan's mind was solely focused on Miss Rudolph. It was at that moment he discovered that many of his previous assumptions were utterly false. Lan Lan appeared desperate and pleaded with Chen Daolin to listen to her explanation. However, he was not going to allow her to speak her mind. He continued to recount his experience. He continued to describe how, at dawn, Lan Lan emerged from the tent and announced that Miss Rudolph was awake. This meant that Lan Lan no longer needed to attend to Miss Rudolph or perform any healing spells. At that moment, Lan Lan glanced at him and returned to the tent. He couldn't help but wonder if something was wrong with Miss Rudolph. Maybe it was her words or even just a single strand of her hair. But in Lan Lan's eyes, they held a significance that surpassed Chen Dao Lin, who seemed replaceable. Chen Dao Lin was determined to make his point, and he wasn't about to back down. He recounted the time when Lan Lan expressed her desire to escape with him and leave the temple once they arrived in the Roland Empire. The thought of that plan made Chen Daolin incredibly happy. However, at that very moment, Lan Lan was overcome with a sense of dread. Chen Daolin continued to explain that he had finally realized that he had been too naive. Lan Lan felt a wave of dread wash over her as she listened to his words. Chen Daolin revealed his naive belief that things between Lan Lan and Miss Rudolph would eventually pass. He thought that if he were patient enough, things would change. But now, he understood that he had been too naive as well. With those words, Chen Daolin turned to Barossa and asked her to leave with him. Lan Lan was shocked by this sudden request. However, after a brief moment of silence, Chen Daolin shared how he had cherished Lan Lan like a precious treasure, only to realize that she had treasured someone else. Someone who effortlessly captured her heart with a simple gesture. And because of that, Lan Lan wouldn't even spare him a glance. Tears welled up in Lan Lan's eyes as she tried to explain her feelings for Miss Rudolph. But Chen Daolin had made up his mind, he had been patient for so long, hoping that his patience would eventually change her mind, but now he knew it was futile. He decided it was time to leave. As he looked at Lan Lan, his eyes softened, and he told her that it was her freedom to like Miss Rudolph. He realized that Lan Lan saw her as her baby, her freedom, and her power. As Chen Daolin gazed into Lan Lan's tearful eyes, he reassured her that she had done nothing wrong. However, he made it clear that he could no longer participate in her manipulative games. With a firm resolve, he turned and walked away with Barossa following closely behind. Lan Lan's sorrow was palpable as she seemed to realize that she had lost Chen Daolin forever. Before leaving, 
Chen Daolin turned back to bid Lan Lan farewell. As he looked into her tearful eyes and pitiful expression, he explained that parting ways was the best decision for both of them. Just as he was about to depart, he was stopped by Miss Rudolph, who had arrived with her guards. Miss Rudolph, having just learned of the previous night's events, apologized for everything that had transpired. She acknowledged Chen Daolin's intention to travel south, but cautioned against the dangers of the Beast Men's territory. She proposed that they travel together for safety and mutual support. Furthermore, Miss Rudolph sought Chen Daolin's advice and suggested that he and Barossa could walk behind the caravan if they preferred not to travel in close proximity. In a surprising turn of events, Barossa improvised a whistle by placing a leaf in her mouth. The Tulip family caravan's guards were taken aback by the sudden action, mistaking it for an ambush. A flash of white caught their attention, causing them to go on high alert to protect the young master. To their surprise, it was a white deer summoned by Barossa. At that moment, Miss Rudolph took charge and ordered everyone to remain calm, forbidding any actions without her explicit orders. She was confident that the deer posed no harm. Chen Daolin realized their ride had arrived and turned to Miss Rudolph, promising to walk behind the caravan. He urged them not to waste any more time and to start their journey. As he spoke, he completely disregarded Lan Lan's presence. A week later, while camping at night, Chen Daolin held a crystal ball in his hand. Barossa, looking concerned, asked about it as Chen Daolin had been staring at it for a while. In response, he asked if she knew what mages were. He then explained that Miss Rudolph had lent him the crystal ball to test his talents. However, Barossa was naturally confused because the young master of the Tulip family had treated them unkindly before. Chen Daolin clarified that two days prior, Miss Rudolph had invited him for a chat to lighten the mood, and it was during that conversation that she gave him the crystal ball. After Miss Rudolph had explained the esteemed status of magicians in the Empire and the privileges they enjoyed, Chen Daolin became curious about the requirements for becoming a magician. However, he quickly dismissed the idea when Miss Rudolph suggested that he acquire the identity of an Empire citizen in order to enroll in the Imperial Magic Academy. Only then would he have the chance to become a mage, provided he possessed the necessary talent for magic. Intrigued, Chen Daolin inquired about what exactly talent meant in this context. Miss Rudolph proceeded to explain that talent referred to one's sensitivity to magic and one's ability to harness various elements in the world. Chen Daolin, eager to understand how talent could be measured, watched as Miss Rudolph revealed a crystal ball, which she claimed was a tool for testing one's power induction. Intrigued by the prospect of magic, Chen Daolin's interest piqued Miss Rudolph's willingness to lend him the crystal ball. She instructed him to place his palm on it and sit calmly for a while. If he experienced any illusions, such as seeing flames or hearing the howling wind or babbling streams, it would serve as proof of his talent, and each of those illusions represented the different areas and specialties of magic. Each mage had a unique focus for their talent. Generally, a mage's talent was specialized in only one area. During the talent test, the more magnificent and grander the illusions, the stronger the mage's talent would be. Miss Rudolph assured Chen Daolin that she would recommend him to some reputable mages if he showed signs of possessing a talent. Later that night, Chen Daolin attempted to take the test using the crystal ball. However, he became frustrated as he couldn't see anything and found himself in a miserable situation. Determined, he placed his palm against the crystal ball, intending to give it another try. In an instant, he was stunned and quickly let go of the crystal ball, instinctively backing away from it. His face displayed bewilderment as he tried to comprehend what he had just witnessed. The following day, while traveling in the caravan, Miss Rudolph inquired if Chen Daolin had obtained any results. She reminded him that if there was no response from the test, it didn't necessarily mean that the crystal ball was broken, but rather that he might not be suited for it. Awkwardly, Chen Daolin asked once again for the signs of talent, and Miss Rudolph recounted them. Afterward, Chen Daolin reported that he had seen something strange, surprising both himself and Chen. He described a vision of a vast sea stretching as far as the eye could see, with towering mountains rising above it, their peaks reaching into the sky. On top of the mountains, flames burned relentlessly throughout the year, and volcanic magma erupted into the sky. The sky itself glowed a fiery red while the surrounding wind howled. The hurricane whipped up massive waves and a tsunami formed. Miss Rudolph was immediately shocked and asked if the young man was sure about what he had just described. Chen Daolin couldn't believe the reaction his words had provoked. It was surprising to see how Miss Rudolph didn't find his joke funny at all. However, he quickly brushed it off, pretending it was all just a playful jest. Deep down, he wondered if the young master had actually believed him. With a mischievous wink, he confessed that he hadn't seen anything and that he was just an ordinary person after all. Later that night, Barossa approached Chen Daolin, curious about the truth behind his words. As he shared the story of his magical test with Miss Rudolph, Barossa couldn't help but feel uncertain. She suspected that Chen Daolin might have been playing with Miss Rudolph's emotions. 
Chen Daolin found amusement in Barossa's observation and asked her how she knew. Barossa revealed that she had noticed his tendency to be indecent and dishonest, and always looked down whenever he did so. Chen Daolin couldn't help but be amused by how well Barossa knew him, and he admitted that he couldn't keep lying to her anymore. Barossa's excitement grew as she concluded that Chen Daolin had indeed lied about the results of his magical talent test. He must have seen something during that test. Sensing an opportunity to tease her, Chen Daolin playfully asked if she wanted to know what he had seen. With a mischievous smile, he promised to reveal it to her. Barossa eagerly agreed, not realizing what she was getting herself into. Blushing slightly, Chen Daolin boldly asked for a kiss. This unexpected request made Barossa blush even more. Chen Daolin was taken aback by Barossa's reaction, but he knew she was just shy. He decided to close his eyes to make her feel more comfortable. After a moment of silence, he couldn't help but wonder why there was no movement. He silently urged her to relax and not be so reserved. Suddenly, he felt a warm sensation on his cheek and became flustered. Barossa quickly turned away, then glanced back at him and pleaded for him to keep their interaction a secret. Chen Daolin realized that Barossa's reserved nature made her hesitant, even though she cared for him. He knew that patience was vital if he wanted to make a move. Barossa eventually composed herself and asked Chen Daolin to share what he had seen, as she had held up her end of the bargain. With a mischievous grin, Chen Daolin playfully gestured for her to come closer and kneel, hinting at a drawing he wanted to make. As Chen Daolin started sketching, Barossa remained puzzled by his artwork. She protested when he erased the drawing, claiming that time was up. Chen Daolin shrugged and said it wasn't his fault if she couldn't decipher his creation. Chen Daolin jokingly told Barossa that it was her fault for not understanding and teasing her playfully. Barossa accused him of cheating, but Chen Daolin just laughed it off. Ten days later at the Tulip family camp, Miss Rudolph sat in her tent, diligently writing in her journal. She expressed her admiration for Chen Daolin and his unique personality. Miss Rudolph couldn't believe her luck. The seemingly ordinary and sometimes sly guy she had met turned out to be a rare gem of knowledge. He was not only the most intriguing and entertaining person she had ever encountered, but also the only person she could truly confide in. As she wrote in her journal, a realization washed over her, causing her cheeks to flush with embarrassment. She couldn't help but exclaim loudly from her tent, catching the attention of a guard stationed outside. Blushing and flustered, Miss Rudolph couldn't deny her growing fondness for someone so knowledgeable, unique, and shamelessly charming. When it came to astronomy, Chen Daolin's understanding of the stars, the sun, the moon, and constellations left her stunned. His knowledge of geography extended beyond just mountains and rivers. He could effortlessly explain the intricacies of plateaus, basins, and their impact on weather patterns. And in the realm of philosophy, Chen Daolin's grasp on materialism and idealism was truly impressive. Miss Rudolph found herself captivated by his insights on the superhuman theory and human nature theory, eagerly yearning for more. But it didn't stop there. Chen Daolin's expertise in art was equally remarkable. Despite his seemingly crude demeanor, he could eloquently discuss the ethereal beauty of painting techniques and the allure of realism. And when it came to music, he surprised Miss Rudolph even further by casually singing a few songs from his homeland, showcasing a whole new dimension of his talents. Miss Rudolph was taken aback by Chen Daolin's surprising knowledge of music theory. To her astonishment, he delved into topics such as monarchy, autocracy, constitutional monarchy, democracy, classical democracy, and countless other theories that she had never even heard of before. What amazed Miss Rudolph the most was that Chen Daolin even possessed some knowledge about the military. Despite his seemingly inactive nature and lack of equestrian skills, he managed to devise a peculiar strategy for building an army. Engaging in conversations with Chen Daolin became a genuine delight for Miss Rudolph. She found herself lost in thought, gazing up at the roof of her tent, wondering if Chen Daolin was more than just a confidant. However, she quickly dismissed this notion, attributing it to her fatigue and blushing in embarrassment. The next day, Chen Daolin rode alongside Barossa, appearing visibly exhausted. It turned out that Miss Rudolph had kept him up all night, constantly seeking his company. Despite his extensive references to various books, essays, novels, films, and TV history, it seemed that nothing could satisfy Miss Rudolph's thirst for knowledge. Chen Daolin felt as though he was in a battle, as trying to fulfill her intellectual curiosity proved to be more challenging than writing his graduation thesis. Observing his fatigue, Barossa inquired about the reason behind it and what had transpired. The young man's eyes were already marked with dark circles, and he weakly confessed to feeling hollowed out. He grumbled about how terrible it was to encounter inquisitive women. Moments later, Barossa announced that they had finally emerged from the forest. As Chen Daolin gazed at the vibrant green landscape, he couldn't help but be surprised and wonder if they had reached the town yet. During the remaining days, they passed by the Beast Men tribes of the wilderness. Amongst all the tribes they encountered, the only thing that caught Chen Daolin's attention was the overwhelming stench and the aggressive nature of every Beast Man. 
However, in the presence of the Tulip family, the Beast Men remained sensible and refrained from causing any trouble. As Chen Dalin glanced back at the army of Beast Men, he noticed a hint of fear in their eyes. Little did he know this observation would sow the seeds for future events. Before long, they arrived at the Kaspersky defense line. This formidable line stretched for thousands of miles into the northern reaches of the Roland Empire, consisting of numerous fortresses, both large and small. The city walls were constructed at great expense to connect most of these fortresses. Once they had passed through the fortresses, the caravan was officially considered to have set foot on the land of the Roland Empire. It was evening by the time they crossed the defense line, and as the caravan continued its journey, Mr. Guion suggested to the young master that they should rest and enter the town later in the evening. Miss Rudolph readily agreed to the plan and graciously allowed everyone to take a break in the town. She insisted on covering all expenses, allowing them to indulge in as much food and drink as they desired. Her generosity was met with enthusiastic cheers from her crew. When Chen Dalin inquired about the town, Miss Rudolph explained that it belonged to humans and was incredibly prosperous, one of the most prosperous places in the North. This news filled Barasa with excitement, as she had always heard tales of this legendary town back in her homeland. Curiosity got the better of Chen Dalin, prompting him to ask if the town was truly famous. Miss Rudolph's response revealed that it was rumored to be the most liberated paradise in the entire northern continent. These words sparked Chen Dalin's imagination, wondering if people from his world also resided there. He pondered why the town had gained such a reputation. Before long, they arrived at Free Paradise Town. Barossa took the opportunity to share that it was not only the first place, but also the site where the first Tulip Duke and the coalition of beast men and elves had signed an armistice agreement. As a result, the town remained independent, not under the control of either the Roland Empire or the Beastmen Empire. Miss Rudolph agreed with Barossa's statement, but believed that the town was not as extraordinary as she made it out to be. When Chen Daolin asked further, Miss Rudolph explained that since the town served as a boundary between the two factions, neither faction's laws applied there. Furthermore, the Beastmen had little to no control over it. She then challenged Chen Daolin to guess what was most abundant in that town. Drawing from his knowledge of his previous world, Chen Daolin instinctively guessed that the town was filled with smuggled contraband. Miss Rudolph was quietly shocked by his response, but she agreed, explaining that in the land of free paradise, anything could be purchased as long as one had the means to afford it. Regardless of the fact, as Miss Rudolph closed the book she was reading, she revealed that even elf slaves could be acquired with money. Her words caused Barossa to glare at her with a mix of fear and anger. Miss Rudolph reclined in her carriage and asked Barossa not to look at her in that manner, as most of the elf slaves were traded by the Beastmen kingdoms. To her knowledge, several prominent human business groups had already pledged not to partake in such illicit activities. Chen Daolin, being naturally perceptive, remarked that without trade, there would be no criminals. His words caught Miss Rudolph's attention, finding them quite intriguing. She recognized the undeniable logic in his words. Still, she felt compelled to remind him that besides harboring illegal activities, the town had another unique feature that made it renowned in the mainland, wanted criminals. This was the very reason why the place was referred to as a free paradise. However, it was necessary to note that the town earned its title of a free paradise because there was a formidable force working behind the scenes to ensure the safety and security of the area. In other words, the town contained hidden dragons and crouching tigers. With that said, Miss Rudolph wished everyone a delightful stay in the free paradise.